Good morning, Astronomy 1010. Welcome back to part two of lecture one, where we're going to learn about, um, let's see, we're going to do a little more nighttime sky stuff. Maybe we'll throw in the moon there today. We'll learn a little bit about the moon and eclipses and the phases of the moon. And um, we're, we're also going to do some uh, practicing with angles. And then, of course, after our lecture today, we'll be doing our first homework assignment, homework number one. A reminder to the class, to anyone listening now or later, I need to get your lab one and your homework one submitted to me by Saturday because I need to grade them on Sunday and then I'm closing it out and it's a zero no matter what, okay? So keep that in mind, uh, especially if you're watching later on, you've got to finish this by Saturday. Also, I should probably announce to you guys if I haven't already, that I'm obliged by CCRI to do something called verification of enrollment. Um, since people watch at all kinds of weird asynchronous times, the only way I know that you're doing something in this class is if you submit a lab and a homework. Anyone who doesn't submit either lab one or homework one by Sunday, I'm gonna have to mark them as a no-show and I believe CCRI will automatically drop you from the course. And then, then you're in a world of shit. So, please make sure that you get these assignments. This week is particularly critical. Anyways, th those of you who I'm talking to now probably won't have an issue because you're here with me and I'm assuming you're gonna do uh, the, the homework session with me after lecture today. All right, um, in our last class, we learned about something called the small angle formula. And the small angle formula is a relationship between three quantities and it kind of teaches us to understand how to compute or analyze the angular size of an object. As I mentioned last class, even something like rainbow ball subtends an angle in your field of view. And if you ever wanna uh, sort of measure the angular sizes of things in a crude way, uh, let's go here. A reminder that your hand can be used as a rough and ready angular measurement tool. 36. Your outstretched finger subtends approximately one degree. Uh, a fist is about 10 degrees. And if you do the Hawaii hang 10 thing with your arm outstretched, that's, you know, 20, 25 degrees or so. And you can measure the angular size of things, you can also measure the angular separation. For instance, it's showing us here that the two pointer stars of the Big Dipper have an angular separation of about five degrees. You're gonna see us using angles in both ways many, many times in this class. Sometimes we'll wanna compute the angular size of an object, like a planet or a moon. Sometimes we'll wanna find the angular separation between two objects on the sky. Going forward, we're gonna be learning about celestial coordinates and how to track the motions of objects across our sky. And of course, we're gonna be using angles to do that as well. So angles are kind of important uh, in astronomy. Let's go ahead and review uh, the small angle formula and then we'll try a sample problem just to kind of get your feet wet. So I'll start off by drawing the moon, okay? And we have an observer located on Earth who's looking at the moon. And the moon subtends some angular size on the sky, which you might remember is roughly half a degree. Okay. The moon's angular size, let me get the lights on here. Is that good, sir? Okay, the moon's angular size is expressed by the Greek letter theta. It's just a little zero with a line through it, okay? Um, the diameter of the moon, we usually call S, okay? So this is S, and S could stand for size, sometimes when we're measuring the angular separation between two objects, S will stand for separation. So it's a little bit modular like that. Typically in our solar system class, we'll want to measure the sizes of things in kilometers. 
Um, in the small angle formula, the version that you're learning today, the angular size always must be in degrees. That's a must, and I'll explain why in a moment. And the third relationship, of course, is the distance, which we use a little d for, the distance between the observer and the object in question. So this is just a reminder of where we ended up last time. You guys might have gotten uh, a little bit fatigued towards the end. So D is the distance. That's usually measured in kilometers as well. These three things are related by the legendary small angle formula. This formula is a classic in astronomy. You sort of need to learn this just to understand how an astronomer even thinks about the sky. And the formula goes S equals theta times distance times 2 pi divided by 360 degrees. Go ahead and put a box around it. That's kind of a big deal. We'll be using this not once, but many, many times. Where is the glare? Okay, let's try a sample problem. Um, you're gonna be using this in your homeworks today. Two out of our five homework problems involve the small angle formula. So let's try a sample question. Find the diameter of the moon given the following pieces of information. We know that the angular size of the moon is approximately half a degree. And we also know that the distance to the moon is 384,000 kilometers. Let's say I looked that up on Wikipedia, okay? So what we do and the way we solve problems is we first make sure that our units are in a good place. And in this problem, because it's your first sample problem, I'm going real easy on you guys. I couldn't have made this any easier. I expressed the two givens and I've identified which variables they relate to. Our angular, our angular size has to be in degrees and we've got that. And usually you want your distance to be in kilometers so that your size comes out in kilometers. In this case, we're just gonna plug them into the formula and we're gonna practice in our calculators. But first let's write it down. <clears throat> S, the diameter of the moon, is 0.5 degrees times 384,000 kilometers times 2 times pi divided by 360 degrees. All right. Uh, a couple of things that I want you to notice. I'm showing you how to do this in good style. Please take special note that when I set up my problem, I always put my units right into the equation to keep everything well-tracked and well-documented. Secondly, people come to my class with a variety of impoverished math skills. Do you guys know what pi is? I bet somebody does at least, right? Somebody knows what pi is. All right, go ahead. So tell me what you know about pi. Who knows something about pi? 3.14. 3.14159265354. Okay, so what does it mean? It's the radius of a circle. It's not the radius of a circle, well, but it's related. Yeah, it's the math equation for the miss or negative denominator in a circle, or like it has like it's it's off balance. I can't I can't explain it. I, yeah, you're 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 groping towards goodness, but you haven't really hit the nail. Okay, so the idea. Let's just have a little digression about pi. The Greeks, as you know, were obsessed with geometry. Well, I guess you don't know, but you're going to learn about Greek astronomy eventually. The Greeks, the Greeks were obsessed with geometry, and they particularly loved circular shapes. They believed, in Plato's case, he believed that circles were like heavenly, okay? And they would draw circles, sometimes with like a string 
or, or uh, in a piece of in a pencil or sometimes with a compass. And they discovered that anytime they drew a circle, no matter how big or small, that there was always a relationship between the circle's circumference, that is the length around the circle, and the diameter, which is the, the slice through the circle. And what they would do is they would, they would measure the diameter maybe with a length of string, and they would then measure the circumference by wrapping a length of string around it. Obviously the circumference is always going to be bigger than the diameter. And they found that any time they divided the circumference of the circle by the diameter, that's what you were looking for there, Jonathan, the ratio of a circumference to a diameter, they always got this magical number, 3.141, and it's called in mathematics an irrational number because it has no end. The only limit to the precision of pi is the limit to how well you can measure the circumference and the diameter. Um, we don't usually need all those sig figs, but today we have a pi key on our Casio calculator. Let's take a moment to identify it. Um, weirdly, it's actually the same as the EXP key. I better get my uh, Logitech open so that I can zoom in today at key moments. Okay, just give me a second there. Uh, okay. So first, I just want to orient you to the calculator, those of you who do have it. Just in case this isn't obvious, you can see that some of the buttons are in orange. And usually the rule of thumb is, let me, just a moment, guys. It takes a while for this, this tool here to load. Let's, let's bring that into 36. Okay, now you can see my calculator a little better. Usually the deal is, um, if you want to activate an orange key, you have to hit shift first. So for instance, sometimes we use a square root key. And if I take the square root of 25, I have to hit shift and that activates the square root. Pi is a unique key because you can see that it's in gray. So the gray, the grayness of pi means if you hit shift and then exp, you'll of course get pi. But because you have to use pi so often in scientific calculations, they wanted to make it a little bit easier to access. So this is gonna sound kind of weird, but if you just hit EXP with nothing else, you don't actually have to hit shift. If you just hit EXP, you get pi. This is really dangerous for you guys because that means EXP can be wielded in two ways. It's your times 10 scientific notation key. For instance, if I do two EXP three, that's 2000. But if I do two times exp that's two times pi so try to watch out for that you'll have to watch me do the calculations a few times so you don't screw this up anyways be wary of this key it's dangerous all right obviously we're going to want to use that let's talk about how we do this calculation here we're going to do it all in one clean shot anytime i punch you guys should punch also in your calculator so we're just going to march our way right through this first time around i'll do it with you so we'll do 0.5 times 3840000 times 2 times pi divide by 360. And then at the very end, we hit equals. Everyone, hold them up and show me what you got. I want to see that you can do this. Show me what you got. Yep. Yep. Um, Yudi, you got it. Amanda, good. Jenny, it looks like everyone who's got a calculator is doing this right. Okay, great. So what should I write down, my friends? Tell me what the answer is and what should I write down? There's getting the right thing on your calculator and then there's knowing how to transform it into something meaningful on the page. Hey, I got all day. I've got nowhere to go. So if you guys just want to sit here and stare at each other, I'm cool with that. I could get a snack or something. Okay, Ryan, that's not what I want for two reasons. One, you've got too many sig figs. Two, you don't have units. And that's sort of why we're having this discussion is so that you guys can learn what I want to see. 
So Ryan gave it a 3.351 times 10, three. Uh, no, Jonathan, Al although we did use scientific notation for every answer in our labs, remember that for homeworks and for our in-class work, we have a rule. We only put things into scientific notation when it's greater than 1 million. Your answer is not greater than 1 million. So you don't need it was to- a shot in the dark. <laughs> okay, sure, we're talking about it. But Ryan, what, what I'm, I'm sorry, Jonathan, excuse me, Jonathan. Copy. I'm interested in, can you guys round this? Oh my God, Kim, definitely not. Kim, this is not three times 10 to the ninth. All right, Kim, Kim, <laughs> let's just have a chit chat here. This number is of order 3000, okay? Three times 10 to the nine is 3 billion. So that's no bueno. What I wanna know is, okay, now Jenna, Jenna, troll Jenna is doing something I like a little bit more. She no, says- I'm here. I'm here. Oh, are you? Oh, hi, I, I, Jenna, sorry. There's a lot of boxes on my screen. I missed you for a sec. Okay, Jenna, <laughs> what, that's why did you chat it instead of talking to me? Okay, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. listen, uh, Jenna, that's the best I've seen so far. Jenna, believe it or not, you actually kept, I, I think that's pretty good. And I think that would be an acceptable answer. I like how you rounded it. You kept three sig figs. Based on our givens, we probably should keep two. Let's be bold. Although Jenna, Jenna's answer was pretty good. She also has her units. Sorry, let me go to speaker view here. I'm going to be even bolder than you, Jenna. And I'm going to round it to 3,400 kilometers. Although 3,350 kilometers would have been equally as good. And then we put a box around it because that's a classy move. This is how we roll. We get an answer, we round it to something tasteful and honest, and we put our units on it. So uh, nicely done, Jenna. Uh, once again, for that person who said three times 10 to the ninth, I want to address that because I know what you were doing. You counted nine decimal places. Let me get my focus here because you started, whoever did that probably just started way over here and started trying to move decimal places. But don't forget, your decimal point is there. That's where the decimal point is. This is a number of approximately okay. 3,400. Let's make a note to self. This is really important. In this version of the small angle formula, the theta, the angular sized, must be in degrees. And that's to cancel out with the 360 degrees there. You'll notice that in my equation, degrees on top cancel out with degrees on bottom. The, the distance and the size are actually flexible in their units, but they have to be the same. And so usually you'll, you'll want to use kilometers. And we'll see that in our, in our homeworks today. Okay, any questions about this? I don't know if I said this correctly last time, but remember that the moon and the, the sun are pretty much the biggest astronomical objects that you can look at on the sky. I mean, what can you see on the sky with your naked eye? You can see the moon, you can see the sun, you can see planets. How many planets can you see with the naked eye? Take a guess. I, I wanna say like four. You're close, you're very close. Two? Five. Do you know what they are? Well, I know you can see, uh, I think, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and Venus, but I don't know what the fifth one is. The fifth one's Ooh, no. hard to see. Uh, no, Mercury. Oh, really? Mercury. Mercury is usually very close to the sun, so you have to see it very early in the morning or very late at night, and it's, it's not easy to see, but you can see it with the naked eye. Hey, before I forget, let's let's take a note of something kind of funny. Um, eventually, we're going to learn a little bit about the history of astronomy. And uh, let's do slide 100 and then slide 107. So 
the five naked eye planets from classical antiquity, the planets we just discussed, these are planets that can be seen with the naked eye. And in a bit, I'll tell you how you can recognize the difference between a planet and a star. Some of you might have noticed planets just because they're way brighter than stars. Like I said, Mercury is the toughest to observe, so it's, it's understandable that you might not have caught that one. There are five naked eye planets. There is one sun and one moon. That's a total of seven astronomical objects that aren't stars. There's also seven days of the week. Coinky dink, I think not. That's because the sun is for Sunday and the moon is for moon day and Mars got mixed up with the uh, Viking god Zutag, which became Tuzdag. They associate, the Vikings associated the, the Roman god Mercury with their wandering trickster Woden and that became Woden's day. Thursday is literally Thor's day for Jupiter and Venus, uh, the love goddess, uh, became associated with Freetag, that's Friday. Saturn is still Saturn day. Every aspect of our calendars, our timekeeping, our clocks are all intimately connected to the rotation of the sky. And there's, you know, if you go back thousands of years, there were no mechanical clocks. The sky was your clock. And, and so there's a, a strong reason that astronomy and timekeeping are bound together. You'll be learning a lot about that uh, in the next week or so. So the point that I was trying to make is the sun and the moon both have an angular size of less than one degree. Everything after that is going to be a very, very small angle on your sky. And you'll remember that I taught you that there are other units of angles. Uh, we'll be using them in our class today, so I wanted to remind you of this. Let me go to slide, I don't know, 22, see where this is. Um, remember that we can subdivide the degree into two smaller units, the arc minute and the arc second. I, did I define these last time? Okay, you guys remember that? Yeah, I'm just yeah. giving you a little sort of, I'm just kind of reviewing it. Um, an arc minute is something like, it's an angle equivalent to looking at a soccer ball from half a mile away. And um, Jupiter, the planet Jupiter subtends about one arc minute on your sky. It's quite small. Uh, by the way, you cannot see Jupiter as a little disk the way you can the sun or the moon. The limit of human, human vision, the human eye can see down to a minimum angle of about three minutes of arc. It really doesn't matter how close or how far away something is. It could be a, a galaxy on the sky. It could be a little paramecium floating around in your eyeball goo. Anything smaller than three minutes of arc disappears into a speck. Anything larger than three minutes of arc, your eye can usually resolve into a feature. For instance, um, if you go even smaller in angle to an arc second, an arc second is sort of like looking at a dime from two and a half miles away. Obviously, if I held a dime up two miles away from you, you would not be able to resolve any of the features of uh, who's on the dime anyways, LBJ, FDR, one of those guys. Okay. We'll work with angles more going forward. Time for us to do a little bit about the rotation of the sky and to learn how to orient ourselves on the sky. And uh, in a week or so, we're gonna be working with this thing. This is a model of the sky called the celestial sphere. And we actually got this idea from Greek astronomers. The Greek philosophers who were interested in astronomy, shoot, what am I doing here? They literally believed that the stars were fixed to a crystalline sphere which rotated around the earth. Now, that's of course not true. Any science fiction fan out there knows that stars lie at a variety of distances from earth. But when you're first learning how to track the motions of the sky, it's not really helpful to try to think about how far away stars are because you have a more immediate problem, which is just, if you're standing on a rotating globe, how do you make sense of the rotation of the sky? And for that reason, it's actually useful to go back to the Greek geocentric conception of an earth at the center of the universe and a sky that just kind of rotates around it on a big sphere. And so that's how we're gonna start by thinking today. Um, we're gonna develop a concept of the celestial sphere 
And uh, let me refer you to one of my slides here. Here we go. There we go. Slide 47. So here's a, a model of the celestial sphere seen with North Pole pointing up, okay? We're gonna note three positions. I'll take notes on this in just a second. The North Celestial Pole, which is the projection of the North Pole onto the sphere. The South Celestial Pole here is the projection of the South Pole onto the sky. We can also project the Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere, and that's called the celestial equator. So let's take some notes on this because this is a good place to start. Uh, let me make sure my focus is good too. Yeah. Okay. So introducing the celestial sphere. The celestial sphere is a useful lie, okay? It's a lie that's more useful than the truth. And the idea is that it is a sphere of infinite radius on which things like uh, stars, planets, the sun, the moon, Hell, even galaxies, if you want to go there, seem to rotate. There are some key points on the celestial sphere. The celestial sphere has a north celestial pole. All right, and that's the projection of Earth's North Pole. And here's the idea, onto the sky. Not only is this a point on the celestial sphere, this is a point in your sky when you step outside and look up at night at the stars. There is a celestial equator. That's of course just a projection of the equator onto the sky. And then thirdly, we have the South Celestial Pole. That should be obvious what that is. It's the projection of the South Pole. I'm gonna speed this up here. All right, fuck it, I'll say it onto the sky. Grab all that. Sorry about my handwriting. We're going to work on that today. Let me just give a second for you guys to catch up to me. Okay, I'm gonna erase these top two things because I have one more bullet point to give you about the celestial sphere. This might be the most important. Um, I'm gonna put this in a different color to emphasize its importance. You can always see exactly one half of the celestial sphere on your so-called local sky. And I'm gonna underline local sky because that's sort of a buzzword in today's class is a concept called the local sky. You always see, and, and this is assuming that you're on a, a very flat plane like a desert, or maybe you're on a ship at sea where there are no obstructing trees or skyscrapers to block your view. If you're on a flat plane in the desert, you always see exactly one half of the celestial sphere. And I'm gonna draw a picture of your local sky in a moment, but remember when you step outside at night, 
you're seeing something like this as your local sky. You're a dude standing in the middle of a field and the, the sky overhead is basically a hemisphere. It's half of a sphere. Now, one of the reasons why I needed to state this, why it's not obvious, can be seen in this picture here. Most of the time, we tend to think of ourselves as a sort of little dude standing on a really big earth. And when you're a little dude standing on a big earth, you kind of get the impression that the sky over your head is a little dude sky that's kind of localized to where you're standing on earth. But actually, your little dude sky is actually this whole big dude sky up here. All of this, all of this green stuff is all part of your local sky. And the reason why that's true is this picture kind of makes the earth look too big in comparison to the sphere. The sphere has an infinite radius. And so technically the, the earth is so small in comparison to the sky that there's kind of like no difference between the line that goes through your feet here and a line through the center of earth. So I don't know if you guys are following me with this, but if you're not following me, if I'm confusing you, then you might wanna just take my word for it that when you look up at the nighttime sky, you're always seeing half of the celestial sphere. Why is that important? Well, if Earth makes a 24 hour rotation, then kind of your average star is usually up for close to 12 hours, although that's not exactly true. Um, one last thing. There's an object located at the North Celestial Pole. Do you guys know what it is? The North Star? Yeah, what's the name of the North Star? It's okay if you don't know, but I, I was wondering if anyone knew the name of the North Star. This I was, might be wrong, but is it Sirius? No, uh, Sirius is interesting in its own right because it's the brightest star in the sky. Right, 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 okay. I was hoping that somebody, is anyone from my 1020 class here? I saw Amanda before, but now she's gone. No one knows what the North Star is? All right. It's called Polaris. Wait, Austin, you're in, you're hiding there. This is Austin right now, okay? You should know what the hell. I'm learning. Is. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. Fine. You're learning. Um, let's take, since you guys don't know, then let's take a quick peek at Polaris here. Let's learn a little old fashioned, old timey time astronomy here. I should have a picture of Polaris. Here we go. If you look up at the nighttime sky, 69, uh, Polaris is, it's not a very bright star. It's just kind of a medium, medium bright star. And uh, it's actually the tail of the Little Dipper. You can see it from a light polluted sky like Providence or Cranston or Warwick, but it's not very bright. It'll be more bright if you live out in, in the boondocks or if you're down in Charlestown or something, you'll see it a little better. Now it's part of the Little Dipper, but the Little Dipper is actually very hard to see. These stars, I can't really see from, from downtown Providence. I can just barely see those two. I kind of know it's there, so I know what I'm looking for, but, but if you live in a light polluted sky, you probably haven't seen the Little Dipper before. The Big Dipper, however, is quite bright and it's easy for everyone to see. If you're interested in finding Polaris on a clear night, you can, you can use these front two stars of the, of the basin of the Big Dipper. They're called the pointer stars because if you follow a line connecting the two stars, it roughly points up towards Polaris. So I have an unofficial assignment for you guys. You know, if you're out uh, at night sometime this month, Take a peek, look for the Big Dipper, see if you can find Polaris. That would be, that would be kind of a cool thing. Um, Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky. It is not directly over your head. We're gonna talk about where Polaris is in just a moment. Uh, what we have to do now is we have to have a little Bob Ross time. We're gonna make uh, a picture of our local sky. Uh, let's see here. So this is a picture that we're gonna draw now. We're gonna focus on, on uh, talking about how stars rotate across our sky. 
How many of you guys actually went out and got a ruler? Does anyone have one of these? Are we sleepy? No one? No one got a ruler? I have okay. one. It's just at home. All right. Well, find something. If you don't have... All right. Austin's got one. Hell yeah. Okay, Austin. I like you. Anyone else? No? Well, if you don't have a ruler, you're going to have to... You're going to have to try to find a straight edge. Oh, uh, in a pinch, you could use the edge of your calculator as a straight edge. Okay, Jenna's got one. That makes me happy. We're going to make a we're going to make a little drawing for the next part of our notes here. We're going to draw our local sky. All right. Introducing a 3D view of so-called local sky. And this thing that I'm about to teach you here, part of the purpose is to teach you some vocabulary terms related to your sky. Part of this is to teach you how to draw it so that you can do this if you're on a test or something and you want to work out a problem. Um, if you're doing it at home, you might want to make a line about 10 centimeters on your page. Do it about halfway down the page. We're going to need some headroom here. Actually, I'm going to need all of this board, so I have to erase that. OK. Um, if you've made your line 10 centimeters, mark the midpoint with a little dot, OK? If you've winged it, try to figure out where the midpoint is. Now, in order to draw a dome, I'm going to take the radius, which in your case would be about five centimeters, and I'm going to make a dot five centimeters above uh, the line, above the center line. And I'm actually going to draw in a few dots that are five centimeters away. This is kind of a little trick to help you make a nice, neat dome. You can kind of mark out the radius at a few key points. And this will this will keep our diagram looking pretty snazzy, I think. OK. Now that I've marked out a few dots, I'm going to kind of, you know, you can just freehand it too, but a nice, neat diagram really brings the whole thing together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of connect the dots and make the best damn dome that I can. That's not too shabby, actually, all right? Now, this is the dome of our local sky. In order to make it three-dimensional, I'm going to put a little dash above the center point and a little dash below the center point. And then I'm going to kind of make an oval. And I'm going to connect the edges to those dashes. Not too shabby. Uh, in fact, if you want to get nice and artistic, we can even shade in the ground with a little green grass here. Some happy little grass strokes. A local sky. All right. Now, we've got the dome of our sky. The first thing that we need to do, it's imperative that we mark out the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Because I am a right-handed person, by convention, I always like to put the north hand the north uh, direction on the right-hand side of the page. So right is going to be north. Uh, left is going to be south. Um, out of the plane of the board will be east. And into the plane of the board will be west. This is something that students often forget to do, but it's really important. You've got to mark north, south, east, and west so that you know uh, where the directions are in the, uh, in the sky. Okay, um, don't forget that there is a little observer dude, and the observer is a person who's sort of standing in the middle of the field here, okay? So there's, I'll just draw a little happy observer, okay? First thing we're gonna do is we're going to take our rulers and we're gonna draw a line through the head of the observer right up to the top of the sky.
We'll mark that point with a Z. This is a new vocabulary word for you. It's called the zenith. The zenith is just simply the point over your head. Next, we're going to identify the horizon. The horizon is a 360 degree ring at the base of your local sky. In other words, that oval that we just drew in there, that's your horizon ring. Third, we'll identify a new term called the meridian. The meridian is an arc that starts due north on your horizon, comes up through your zenith, and then it sets due south. In other words, the meridian is the name of this arc that we kind of drew in here for our dome. So we'll say the meridian is an arc that rises due north reaches the zenith and then sets due south. These points are fixed on your local sky no matter where you go on Earth, okay? Whether you're on the North Pole or the South Pole or the equator, you're always gonna have a zenith, a point overhead, you'll always have a horizon, and you'll always have a meridian. Let me explain uh, for a moment the importance of the meridian, why it's important to have this vocabulary term. Um, let me give you like a, a preview of where we're going with this. If you stand outside at night and you watch the nighttime sky rotate, from our location in Rhode Island, the night sky is doing something sort of like this. The green disc is the ground where you're standing. And as the, as the sky rotates, stars just like the sun will rise in the east, they will come up overhead and then they will sink back down and they set in the west. And most stars are kind of fixed to some location in the sphere, but they, they follow these tracks, these colored circles that you see are sometimes called diurnal circles or more lamely star tracks. The meridian is here. It's this white dome that's over the head of the observer. And the importance of the meridian is that, okay, we gotta, we gotta get this, uh, this background noise under control here. Let me see what I can do. Jonathan, is that you? Thanks, buddy. Okay. Um, the importance, the importance of the meridian is the meridian represents the highest point that a star will reach in its journey throughout the sky. So during the course of the night, a star will get highest in the sky when it crosses the meridian and it will come back down. In the future, we're gonna start to think of the sky as a giant rotating clock. Clocks are actually based off the rotation of the sky. And in that sense, the meridian is kind of like the 12 o'clock hand uh, on a clock. It's the, it's the highest point that a star will make in its journey throughout the sky. Okay, um, suppose we're located in Rhode Island. What if we wanted to make this a little more Rhode Island specific? Let's dial back here to where I was a few moments ago. If I'm standing in Rhode Island, should I be able to see the North Celestial Pole in my local sky? What do you guys think? Zachary says yes, we should, right? Because if we can always see one half of the local sky, if I'm anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, the, the North Celestial Pole should be somewhere in my sky, right? So let's go ahead and add this to our diagrams 
we're going to make this Rhode Island specific by putting in the North Celestial Pole. And to do that, I'm going to take a blue marker. I'm going to draw a line from the foot of my observer up into the northern part of the sky, about halfway up. Okay. Put an arrow. This is the North Celestial Pole. I usually like to abbreviate it as NCP. And um, let's put a star right on the sky there. That's where Polaris is. Polaris is approximately at the North Celestial Pole. So NCP stands for the North Celestial Pole. OK. I can also draw the celestial equator onto my sky. This takes a little bit more artistic skill here. The celestial equator, let's just take a look at my diagram so that you guys can see what I'm trying to do. Oh, I think it's slide 47. There we go. So the celestial equator is a ring that runs east to west through your local sky. And I want you guys to notice that it makes a kind of 90 degree angle with the North Celestial Pole at all points. So we're going to attempt to draw this. I'm not really good at it, but here's, here's how I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to make a line that's kind of uh, at a right angle, at a 90 degree angle to my North Celestial Pole. I'm going to put a little dot up there or a dash. That's where I want my arc to reach. You guys probably can't see that. And now I'm going to kind of draw a horseshoe that goes from the east through the dot to the west. Like I said, I'm, I'm sort of bad at this. That's about the best that I can do freehand. Not very good, but. Well, I'm going to erase this in about 10 seconds anyways, but there you go. All right. Let's let's abbreviate the celestial equator as CE. Okay, that's the abbreviation I use for the celestial equator, and we'll put that down here. CE stands for the celestial equator. You'll remember that's the projection of Earth's equator onto the sky. Taken together, the zenith, the horizon, the meridian, the north celestial pole, and the celestial equator are sometimes known as the fundamental positions of your local sky. I'm teaching them to you because these are vocabulary words that I'm going to use in my everyday speech. And you'll want to remember what all these things mean. One last thing before we leave this subject. Let's talk about what happens if you go out at night and you set up a tripod and you put a, a camera on the tripod and you just kind of point it up towards Polaris. You get kind of a cool photograph and I've got a few of them. We can find more on the internet too. But let's start with this one here, slide 70. This photographer has attached their camera to a tripod, pointed it up towards the North Celestial Pole and they've left the shutter open and taken a long exposure photograph, probably about five or six hours long. During the course of the night, as Earth spins, all of the stars seem to rotate and circulate around Polaris. Um, if you were to look south instead of north, you'd see, you know, it's kind of hard to show you because a picture is two dimensional and the sky is three dimensional. But if you look south, you would see stars kind of rising in the east coming up to your meridian and setting in the west. But when you look north, it's cool because you can kind of see all the stars circulating around Polaris. Now, there is a subset of the stars which are known as circumpolar stars. Circumpolar stars are those stars which are so close to Polaris that they never set below your horizon and they can be seen all night. They can't be seen all day because it's bright out, but 
they will be up during the day as well. And these circumpolar stars are stars which are close enough to Polaris that they never set below the horizon. Um, so for instance, these stars, these circles that I'm drawing are circumpolar, but these stars over here are not circumpolar, they set below your horizon. Um, let's just draw in with a purple marker a couple of those circumpolar stars. I'm afraid that if I don't do it now, I'll forget to define these. So we'll just draw a couple of dashed lines here. And, and these purple lines represent the tracks of circumpolar stars. Okay, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, Jonathan, I'll have the video posted as soon as I can after class. Make sure you watch and make sure you get that submitted. Okay, circumpolar stars. Here's a cheap definition, a cheap and easy definition for circumpolar stars is that they never rise or set. And these are circumpolar stars. All right. Let's just take a moment to make sure you guys have all that. Sorry, my camera can't see the entire board at once. I guess I could move it a little further away, but. Okay. All right, um, how are the note takers doing? Uh, do you guys need more time in this or can I erase? I unfortunately need to erase that. Okay, looks like um, everyone's good. I actually good. had a question. Nori, hit me. Um, so you said the meridian was the arc around everything. Let's, and let's, you also said- Rory, it's a north mm -hmm. to south arc through your sky. Mm -hmm. it, it slices your sky right in half, okay? Mm -hmm. You also said that it was like the highest point that a star can hit. Yep. Did you mean that on any point of the arc or did you mean that like only on like the zenith point? Um, I meant that for, for any star on the sky. Well, mm -hmm. yes. No, I do mean that for any single star in the sky, okay? Now, mm -hmm. this stuff is kind of new to you guys. I, I've been thinking about it for a long time. You guys have been thinking about it for about 30 minutes. So it takes a little while to adjust to, to these thoughts. Mm -hmm. But let me once again share with you, Nori, this very important picture from my slideshow. This is a really important picture because it, it kind of shows you what's happening for a bunch of different stars during mm -hmm. the night. So <clears throat> remember, Nori, that each star, let me just see if I can find your face here. Wait, oh, there you are, okay. Each star is kind of pinned to the sky, kind of like pin the tail on the donkey. A mm -hmm. star that's pinned there will be forced to rotate on the blue line as it rotates through the sky. So, uh, shoot, I lost you here. Where are you? Oh, Sorry, hey. someone was calling me. That, no, it's okay. I, it's no big deal. I just I wanted to be able to see your face to see if you were understanding me. Um, no, you're good. Uh, if a star was located here on the sky, it would remain stuck to this blue track. So you can see, Nori, that as it rises above your eastern horizon, the very mm -hmm. highest point it will make will be at the meridian, and then it will sink back down. But that's also true if you're a star here at the red ring. This red ring, of course, is the celestial equator. And for instance, you know, uh, you know the three stars that make up Orion's belt? They are pretty much, I don't know if you know them, but they're actually, this is slide 68. It's, it's slide one. The three stars in Orion's belt are pretty much right at the celestial, shoot. Sorry, I'm screwing up. They're pretty much right at the celestial equator. So if you're a star in the belt of Orion, you're gonna be stuck to this track here, the red track, and you'll also rise in the east. And also it's true that your highest point in the sky will be the meridian. So no matter what ring you're on, you're always gonna get the highest in the sky when you cross the meridian. Usually okay. the way astronomers think about it is the meridian, when a star is on the meridian, that's exciting because that's the best time to observe it. You're gonna get a really good view of it that won't be blocked by buildings or trees and other things like that. Okay, so good questions, that helps me. 
Um, let's go ahead and erase now with everyone's permission, because we have to teach you some, some other things. Uh, in fact, if you guys can hold on a second, I need to Windex this because the boards, you can't see it through the camera, but it's getting crusty. And this is going to destroy my markers. Just cleaning up our act here. OK, now we have to do something that's not totally fun, but is really useful. We're going to learn how to describe the positions of stars with stellar coordinates, or at least I want to do two of them, OK? So uh, just to give you a top-down view of where I'm going, in this class, if you want to be able to talk about how stars rotate through your sky, we're going to need to use three sets of coordinates. So there are three coordinate systems that I need to teach you. The first should be a review of what are called geographical coordinates. And you've probably heard of latitude and longitude. These tell you where you are on Earth. And we need to review those because where you go on Earth will determine where the stars are in your sky. The stars in your local sky at the North Pole are completely different from the stars in your local sky if you're at the South Pole. Each location on Earth has a unique local sky. Then we're gonna wanna talk about how, how we describe the motions of stars through the sky. And we're gonna need a coordinate system called the horizon system. The horizon system is an easy set of angles to just sort of describe how stars rise and set in your local sky. Now, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do the third one today. I might kick the third one to, uh, sorry, Monday's next Monday's class. But there's a third coordinate system called the equatorial system. And this one's a little more complex. This is kind of like latitude and longitude for the sky. It's a set of coordinates that stay fixed to your celestial sphere. You can see there's a bunch of coordinates tick marked out on this sphere. And they're useful because they're, they're good for describing the positions of stars in the global sky. And that does not depend on your location on Earth. What I want to do today, if I can manage it before we start our homework, I've got roughly a half an hour my plan, my strategy, is today I want to cover the first two. And then rather than going on to the third, I want to cover the phases of the moon and the rising and settings of the moon and eclipses, because that's going to be featured in our homework. If I can do these two things, plus talk about the moon and eclipses, we'll be perfectly ready to tackle our homework today. So let's get right into it. We'll start with geographical coordinates, OK? Um, the two angles that we're going to be considering are latitude and longitude. Um, in a spinning Earth, the equator is a unique circle on Earth because the Earth is kind of symmetrical above and below. There's a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. So geographical coordinates kind of make use of the Earth's equator as a reference point. For latitude, and the mnemonic devices, latitude are like rungs of a ladder. They measure north and south on the uh, Earth relative to the equator. So we define the latitude as the degrees of an observer measured north or south of the equator. And just as a cheap example, 
Um, if I were to describe the latitude of the North Pole, for example, the North Pole has a latitude of 90 degrees north. Longitude, on the other hand, lines of longitude slice through the earth in the same way that tangerine slices uh, make up a tangerine. They kind of run north to south. But of course, longitudes measure east to west. One of the awkward things about longitude is unlike with the equator, all the different lines of longitude that slice through the earth are kind of they're arbitrary. There's no clear point at which to start or stop the longitude lines from. So humans, astronomy-minded humans, decided that the zero degree line of longitude, which is known as the prime meridian, would be a line of longitude that slices through the Earth. Let's take a look at it here, 62. The prime meridian, which is the zeroth line of longitude, would be a line of longitude that slices right through the front door of the Royal Greenwich Observatory in England, okay? And so this line of longitude passes right through the Royal Greenwich Observatory, and it divides the Earth into an eastern and a western hemisphere. A kind of cool thing you can do if you ever visit the Greenwich Observatory, if you're on a trip to London, is you can go there and you can sort of stand with one foot uh, in the Western Hemisphere, one foot in the Eastern Hemisphere, and you can kind of take a selfie and post it to your Instagram. That's, that's sort of a thing that people do. In fact, one of my former students traveled to uh, the Prime Meridian. They traveled to uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory, and they brought me back my very own Prime Meridian pencil from the gift shop. And this is now a treasured item on my cart, okay? So you can't borrow my prime meridian pencil, but you can feel free to send me gifts and presents uh, if you travel to the Greenwich Observatory. We're gonna measure lines of longitude from that position. So we define longitude as degrees measured east or west of the prime meridian in um, our homework session next week we're going to need to know the latitude and longitude of providence rhode island to do our homeworks and it's probably something you should know anyways just as an educated person um for providence rhode island we are approximately at a latitude of 42 degrees north and a longitude of 71 degrees west of the prime meridian. Let's just goof off for a quick second here. I want to show you guys something. Uh, if you have an iPhone, mine is a little old, but it's still technically an iPhone. Uh, most of you should have a, a compass app. Now, you probably have something like this if you have a not iPhone, if you have a Google phone, but I don't really know what that, where, where exactly to find it. Feel free to chime in if you do. But if you go to your, your compass app on the iPhone, it'll actually tell you your exact latitude and longitude on Earth. And now, one of the fun things about doing this class remote is you guys are located probably all over Rhode Island. So it'd be cool if you guys could just open that up for a second. Let's see if we can make sense of this. I need to focus, get the right distance. I am at a latitude of 41 degrees. What do you think this stuff is over here? Hmm, what, what, are, what are these two numbers? Do you guys recognize those symbols? I mean, it looks like it's saying feet and inches. It's not feet and inches though, because latitudes and longitudes are angles. What have we learned about angles? We learned that you can measure it in degrees, but you can also measure it in what? Um, is it arc second, arc minute? Right, the 49 arc minutes 
arc minutes are a little uh, tick, a single tick mark, arc seconds. So what this means is not only am I 41 degrees north, but if you think about it, there's 60 arc minutes per degree. So I'm damn close to 42 degrees north, right? 41 degrees and, and 50 arc minutes is like almost 42 degrees. And they even give you my position to the nitty gritty, give, it, give you it in arc seconds. Likewise, my longitude is 71 degrees, 24 arc minutes and 51 arc seconds. So they use arc minutes and arc seconds for latitude and longitude. Now I'm located in uh, downtown Providence. Um, which one of you are far away from me? Is anyone like in South County or Newport or who's far away from me? No one is? Like, I mean, is anyone like doing this class right now from the Southern part of the state or are you guys all in Cranston? What's up? I'm in North Providence. All right, that's pretty damn close. Yeah, I'm Thank also you. Providence. Huh? Oh, you're also in Providence? Okay, so I don't know. You should look at your location on Earth. Get excited about life, guys. Ah! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, let's move on. So you know geograph okay, let's know. Let's try another question. What's the uh, what's the longitude of the North Pole? Take a guess. Would it be zero? Yudi, that's not exactly wrong, but it's not exactly right either. The problem, Yudi, is yes, zero degrees of longitude does pass through the North Pole. But you'll notice, Yudi, that so does 30 degrees longitude and so does 60 degrees west longitude. In fact, all lines of longitude converge at the North Pole. So j right when you get to the North Pole, longitude breaks down and becomes undefined. In mathematics, we call a point like this a degenerate point. It's degenerate. Um, that's still OK, UD, because even though longitude breaks down at the North Pole, the latitude of the North Pole is 90 degrees north, and that specifies a unique location on Earth. That's not true about 30 degrees north, because 30 degrees north passes through a whole bunch of different regions. But just when longitude breaks down, latitude does the whole job for you. I just wanted to point that out because, I don't know, it's confusing and who knows, it could be a test question or something, wink, wink. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and let's talk now about the horizon system. I'm gonna erase this unless anyone objects. So would the South Pole be the same thing? That's right, the South Pole is mm -hmm. also a degenerate point in longitude. In fact, if you want to get super abstract, there's some theorem in higher order mathematics that teaches us that anytime you create a coordinate system on a curved surface, there will always be two points that are degenerate, okay? So so this is something that you cannot avoid when you build your coordinate system. Um, and I I heard you, but I don't really understand what that really means. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, well, it's not that important that you understand that. That was me kind of going off on a wing okay. tangent here. But but just let me humor you for a second, Ian. Okay. <laughs> if you're interested in abstract things, which I guess I am, right? Um, in astronomy, we're constantly dealing with the problem of spheres. Earth is a sphere. The planets are spheres, but even like the galaxy and the universe itself could potentially be spherical. And sooner or later, you kind of want to know where the F you are, right? You want to orient yourself and come up with a coordinate system. When you come up with a coordinate system on a flat terrain, like if you're trying to find a coffee shop in New York City, the situation is really easy because you can just grid out a bunch of perpendicular lines, right? And you can have streets and avenues. And if I say, hey, let's grab a beer at 49th Street and 6th Avenue, then you know just where the F that is if you look at the signs. The problem is sometimes you need to create coordinate systems on curved surfaces. And if you start analyzing the problem, there's limited numbers of ways you can do it. Usually, the most logical way is you create a set of lines like latitude and longitude. 
and they need to be perpendicular to each other. You have these latitude lines and then longitude lines. But there are other ways to do it. Then there's some clever people who have nothing better to do all day except for mathematics, and they start analyzing the problem at more abstract levels, and they realize that there's some limitations. You know what? This shit's over your pay grade. I shouldn't have even brought it up. Never mind. But sometimes it's fun to, to hint to you guys that there are worlds beyond the ones we're discussing here. Yeah, I was just trying to, because I understood like the 90 degrees north thing, but then I was like, if it's not zero, but kind of is zero, what does that mean well, for longitude? <laughs> it's, in other words, if I say I'm at 42 degrees north latitude, that does not tell you where I am on earth because 42 degrees is not a unique point. However, if I say, yo bra, I'm at 90 degrees north latitude, I could only be one place on earth. And that's hanging out with Santa Claus at the North Pole. So okay. in that sense, it's okay that longitude breaks down. Maybe that's um, the part that so I was- literally saying that there just is not a longitude. There is that. no longitude. It's under. Oh, okay. Yep. And I'm also telling you that that's okay. It's not, it's not bad. Okay, let's talk about another coordinate system. Now, presumably, we know how to find ourselves on Earth. What if we want to describe the- uh, It says my internet connection is unstable, but hopefully- That'll clear itself up. What if I want to find an object on the sky? Then I would probably use the horizon system. The horizon system, which is designed for local sky use, involves two angles. One is called altitude, and the other is called azimuth. Altitude is defined as the degrees of a star or planet above the nearest horizon. So it's the degrees of a star above your nearest horizon. In other words, the altitude tells you how many degrees up, okay? The azimuth tells you how to find the star along the horizon. So the azimuth is the degrees along the horizon measured clockwise from north. And once you write that down, I should probably show you a diagram to help you understand this. Okay, check out this admittedly crappy picture. Here's a dude standing in a field looking at a star. And north in this case is kind of up here where the red tick mark is. If I wanna find the altitude of a star, I start at the closest horizon and I just ask how many degrees up is that star? And in this case, I would say that the altitude of that star is maybe 30 or maybe 40 degrees up from the horizon. The azimuth tells you how far along the horizon the star is measured clockwise from north. So if north is here and that's zero degrees, um, I'd spin around the circle 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and I'd probably have to go a little bit more I would say the azimuth of that star is maybe 300 degrees. And that's how we can identify the position of any star on our sky clearly. I'd like to point out that azimuth is kind of the same thing as direction on the ground. So there is a unique azimuth for every direction point. So for instance, due north has an azimuth of zero degrees. Due east has an azimuth of 90 degrees. Due south has an azimuth of 180 degrees. Due west has an azimuth of 270 degrees. Okay, Ian, since you're curious about coordinate systems, okay, why don't you play a little game with me? 
and see if you can figure this out. What do you think the altitude of your zenith is, Ian? Um, <laughs> and this is just going to be a wild guess, probably. Um, Pardon? So this is probably just going to be a wild guess, but... That's, that's okay. So I, if we're starting at the horizon yep. to start measuring, I don't know, maybe like oh, 90... Very like good. Semi circle. That's that's good. So let's just let's go through how we figured that out. Okay, I'm just trying to get my my. So here's your zenith. It's the point overhead, and he argued you start at the horizon, and you go up. How many degrees? Well, it's a 90 degree angle because you can see from here to here is a, is a is a perpendicular line. So. To go from the horizon up to your zenith, it's 90 degrees. Very good. Let's take that down. The zenith has an altitude of 90 degrees. Let's try it again, Ian. What is the azimuth of the zenith? Well, based on what I just asked you about, I'm going to guess that this is it's a uh, degenerate point for this. Excellent. Very good. The, the azimuth of the zenith is, we could say, undefined, or if we want to be mathematical, we would say degenerate, excellently done. And let's just verify why that is, uh, Ian. Your azimuth is your closest point on the horizon. But just think about it. If you're up at, if you're up at the zenith up here, all the points on the horizon are equidistant from the zenith. There is no one place on the horizon that's any closer than any others. So azimuth, just like longitude, kind of breaks down at the zenith. Nicely done. OK, now you guys know a little bit about how to find uh, a star in the sky. You know a little bit about how to find your place on Earth. Let me see if I've got time for moon stuff. I got a little bit of time for moon stuff, or maybe we won't get it all. Okay, put that on ice. We're gonna need that in a little bit. For the last 10 minutes of our class, we're gonna be asked some questions about the moon. Let's just do a little fun stuff and, and learn our phases of the moon. This is some like some stuff for life that you can enjoy. I don't know if you guys noticed, but after our lecture on Monday, I took a nice long walk and, and the moon was high in the sky and quite bright, even during the day. Anyone notice the phase of the moon the other day? Does anyone know their phases of the moon? I did at one point. I could probably try and fill it in. Well. Do you want me to? <laughs> well, yeah, by all means, tell me what the phase of the moon is. Um, I know there's a uh, new moon. Yeah. Uh, oh, God. Um, well, I was I was wondering Ian, if you noticed what the phase of the moon is today, like or or I did not. I have not been outside, and also oh, okay. it's pretty cloudy. <laughs> well, it's cloudy. I think on Monday is I just the moon looked really cool. Like I saw a bunch yeah. of people posting Instagram photos of it. So I, I didn't know if you guys knew what the phase of the moon are. Anyways, that's why you pay me. I'm here to teach you about that. Um, I didn't learn my phases of the moon till graduate school. So another fellow graduate student taught me this trick, and now I'm going to teach it to you. Let's learn the eight phases of the moon. So we're going to make a little drawing here to, to help us. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with Earth in the center of the page. Leave a lot of headroom here and draw a circle at the center of your page that rep represents the Earth, OK? So uh, this is Earth. And what we're going to do is we need to specify the direction of sunlight for you to learn your phases of the moon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start and imagine that the sun is way the hell off to the right side of the page. And I'm going to identify that by showing some rays of sunlight coming from this direction. And we're going to write to the sun. So that's the direction from which the sunlight is coming. If sunlight comes in this direction, obviously the side of Earth facing the sun will be the daytime side. And the side away from Earth will be the nighttime side. Let's go ahead and draw in what astronomers call the terminator. The terminator 
is the boundary between the daytime and the nighttime side of Earth. So there's your terminator. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of shade in the nighttime side of the Earth. Okay, the next thing I need to tell you is that the spinning earth is kind of like a big giant clock. As I'll discuss next week, we keep solar time with our clocks and our watches. Solar time means we mark the passage of time by marking the journey of the sun through the sky. If you're a dude standing here where this tick mark is, the sun will be overhead the sun will be at your meridian in your local sky. What time is it when the sun is on your meridian? Uh, noon. Right. Noon is when the sun makes its highest journey through the sky. By the way, just as stars, uh, where was that person I was talking to? Nori, just as stars cross the meridian at their highest point through the sky, so does the sun and so does the moon. So here, if you're an observer located there, it's 12 p.m. Likewise, if you're an observer located here, that's 12 a.m. Do you guys remember which direction the Earth spins in space? Which direction does Earth spin? Counterclockwise. Very good. So if we're looking from the north, let's imagine the Earth spinning counterclockwise. It's, it spins like so. So this position would be 6 p.m. That's sunset when the sun is on your horizon. And this position over here is 6 a.m. And I could fill in even more clock times if I wanted to. Let's just go ahead and do that since you guys are learning. This would be 3 p.m. This is 9 p.m. This is uh, 3 a.m. And this is 9 a.m. So the Earth is a big spinning clock. Okay, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna draw the moon in at eight different positions. First, I'll start here. I'll start here. I'll kind of make a cross. And then I'm gonna fill in the in-between uh, phases as well. Here, here, here. The moon takes about a month to go around the Earth. So on any one given day, like today or Monday, the moon is kind of fixed in one position, the sun is fixed in one position, but the Earth kind of spins around in a 24-hour axis. So no matter where the moon is, the sun is usually over there to the right, and now I'm gonna draw in all of the moon terminators as well. So I'll draw in a terminator and you'll notice that the nighttime side of the moon uh, is always away from the sun. This is a real marker killer, but it must be done. I liked it better when CCRI paid for all the markers. Now that I'm teaching from home, I've got to pay for it and it's not fun anymore. Okay, let's go ahead and let's label all the phases of the moon and then I'll show you how, the, the, how they look when they're on the sky. The moon that is in between the earth and the sun is called the new moon. The, the moon that's on the other side of the Earth from the Sun is called the full moon. As the moon goes from new to full, it's going to be growing and it's going to get brighter and bigger in the well, not bigger in angular size, but you'll see more illumination. And so this side is called the 
remember that the moon also goes counterclockwise around Earth. The waxing side is when the moon is growing. So this is waxing crescent. Um, this phase of the moon here didn't draw that very well. Uh, this is called first quarter. Um, this is waxing gibbous. Um, this side is waning. Waning is when the moon is shrinking. So as the moon shrinks, we go to waning gibbous. This phase is called third quarter. Sometimes people call it final quarter, but I prefer third quarter. And then we have a uh, waning crescent. And this is the phases of the moon, not as you see them on the sky, but these are the phases of the moon as seen from a spaceship that was floating high above the solar system, looking down at the spinning Earth and the moon. Let me borrow some slides here for a second. Where do I do those phases of the moon? They should be in here somewhere. Okay. So let's take a look at what we've drawn so far. So far, we've drawn a picture that looks kind of like this or probably this is a better version and all we've done so far is we've labeled the moons and we can see that the nighttime side of the moon is always facing away from the sun now we want to understand how we get the shapes that you see on the sky and to do that i'm going to use this uh drawing tool here remember that when you see the moon you're usually standing at some location on earth so this arrow is pointing towards an observer's meridian and then you always see half of the moon, the half of the moon that's facing Earth. So notice that um, the new moon is when you don't see any moon for two reasons. One, uh, during a new moon, you're looking at the dark side of the moon. It's not illuminated in your sky. And the other issue, of course, is the new moon is up during the day. So there's two reasons why you can't see the new moon. It's up during the day and you're not even seeing the illuminated portion. On the other hand, with a full moon, it's exactly the opposite issue. The full moon is up at night and you're seeing a full disc that's illuminated. Uh, the half that you're seeing is fully illuminated. Likewise, when you look at a first quarter moon, you're looking usually from this direction and the, the cross section that you make through the moon will show half illuminated and half in darkness. But remember, the moon is, is a sphere, right? So, so during a first quarter moon, you're going to see half of a circle. You're going to see a di half of a disk. The most complicated geometries to understand are the crescents and the gibbous phases. When you're looking, uh, say, from 3 p.m., up towards the waxing crescent moon, you're seeing a slice like so. And here I'm going to want to go back to my board. So let's see if I can pick out some colors. This isn't easy to, to do on the best of days. So you're seeing a cross section of the moon that looks like this, and you're seeing it from that direction, right? So what you're actually seeing is you're seeing kind of a tangerine wedge of the moon, but, 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 remember that the moon is a three-dimensional object. It has a protuberant belly that sticks out front. So when you see a wedge of the moon, when that becomes kind of flattened on the sky, it ends up looking like, like a fingernail. That's what they call the crescent moon in the Arabian Nights, they refer to it as the fingernail moon because you're, you're seeing a kind of a wedge that's been flattened onto the sky. 
Likewise, with a gibbous moon, you're seeing the opposite. You're seeing a wedge of darkness and about three quarters illuminated. So the gibbous moon kind of looks like an egg. It's not quite a full circle. It's my art skills are limited here, but the, the waxing gibbous moon looks like an egg. The crescent moon looks like a fingernail. The first quarter moon or the quarter moons look like a, a half of a disc. And the full moon is a completely illuminated disc. So since my art skills are really not that good, I'll just show you one last slide here. Oh, and I think I did this in the perfect amount of time. A couple slides back, I have the same picture, but now, oops, now we've drawn in what the different phases look like. So new moon, you see nothing. Waxing crescent, you see a fingernail. I don't like this first quarter. First quarter should look like half of a disc. The gibbous moon, the waxing gibbous looks like an egg. Then it goes to full, then back to waning gibbous, third quarter, waning crescent. We can also use these, these, um, these positions on Earth to kind of figure out when the when the moon rises and sets. And I do want to do that next, but I should probably stop to keep this in a timely fashion. Uh, honestly, the the parts of the moon that we're going to need to talk about for our homework today, we actually have to talk about eclipses, but it's impossible to talk about eclipses until you do phases of the moon. So we didn't quite get to where we needed to go, but that's OK. We're going to do our homework together, so I'll make sure you guys get the right answers. All right. This concludes our lecture portion of the class. Now it's going to be time to do our first homework, which is going to be an adventure for you guys. Um, it's customary for us to take a little break and sort of refresh our minds. I can drink some iced tea. Are you guys down for a 15 minute break? We like that, right? Okay. All right. So I'll pause the recording and I'm going to go have a tomato sandwich or something. And then in 15 minutes or so at uh, 1.45, my iPhone doesn't have the same time as, as my, it says 1.30 on my computer, but it says 1.35 on my phone. So if it says 1.35 on your phone, we'll come back at 1.50, right? Okay. All right, see you in a bit. All right, space fans. It's time to do our very first homework. Homework number one. I'm ready to go if y'all are. And I definitely remembered to hit record this time, so that's good. Let's erase this up. Um, since this is your first homework with me, I'm going to kind of show you how we do things here. Uh, we're going to kind of uh, we're going to set it up. We're going to write down the problems. You're going to read them out to me and we're going to solve them together. You're going to need to have your calculators handy. This is, this is you and me working collectively together to solve these problems. Although I will certainly guide you and make sure the answers come out right. <clears throat> I can move as quickly as you guys can. So what determines this, how efficient we are is, you know, how hard you guys try and, and the participation a little bit. So I need you to work with me. Um, why don't we start by going to uh, the homework tab on Blackboard. Hold on, I feel a sneeze coming on here. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, let's escape. Let's escape the moon. And let's go to Blackboard. And I'd like to remind you guys that there is a homework tab on the left. We are doing homework one, and I want you guys to check this out. If you right click chapter two dot PDF, I've actually scanned the questions from the book. Five questions from the back of chapter two. That way, if you don't have a book yet, uh, you can kind of read along with us. Why doesn't everyone open those up in a new tab? Because I'm going to ask you guys to take turns reading me the questions. Um, at the I end of this, we're going to have to take a photograph and turn this in. So you could do it on a new sheet of paper or you could do it inside your notebook. 
but let's maybe start a new page and keep it clean, squeaky clean, okay? So at the top of the page, after formatting, I'd like you to please put your, let me uh, um, speaker view this. Um, please put your name. By the way, some of you, when I was grading the labs, were, were doing stuff like, hey, it's, it's Nick N, or it's, it's Joey P. Don't do that. There's 168 of you. Are you dying to have your grades lost? Please put your first and last name, especially at the beginning of class when I don't know you guys that well. All right, so also let's say this is AS1010. A big help is if you can put your section afterwards. Some of you are in section 001. Some of you are in section 002. Some of you are in section 104, all right? Uh, um, I actually had a question. Yeah. Um, I couldn't really figure out which section I was in. I tried to look for it and I couldn't really figure out where okay. to find that. Who, who is you? Who am I talking to right now? Uh, Nori. Oh, hi, Nori. Okay, Nori, hi. Hi. Um, you know what? Let's just do it right now, okay? Okay. So, uh, hopefully this is, yeah. Okay, so you're either in section, usually it tells you if you look at your schedule, you probably just don't know what the numbers mean if you're if you're new to this game. So spring 2021. All right, what's your last name? Oh, M Murad. Mm -hmm. All right. You're not in section 001. This is actually good because everyone else can see what they're. Okay, section. Uh, you're in section 002. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And just for people watching later on, they can always pause the video. These are the people who are in section one. Oh, God damn it. There's a lot of you. See how many of you there are? It's scary. And I have a whole other class. What section is that one you're on right now? This is 104. Okay. Okay. So hopefully that helps a few of you. Okay. Now that we've straightened that out. <clears throat> Sorry. I also have, it's a really quick question. Um, yeah, yeah. I was getting up all of the stuff from Blackboard while you were saying this, so I, I didn't fully hear you. But so we're doing this as a text submission and writing that at the top. Um, uh, I don't know what you mean by text submission, but we're we're just going to write out the answers. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean like writing in like a text box with like the subject and stuff. Uh, no. So what you're going to do is you're just going to you're going to write the answers down on on your Physical. notebooks or on okay. a piece of paper. Got it. Okay. And then when you're done. You'll take a photo and you'll okay. submit that. Perfect, thank you. Just like we did with lab. Okay. Um, in case there's anyone out there that's gonna try to type this up, there's always one or two of you. If you're typing, you need to do things in a particular way for me. You need to, you, you need to type all of your math using an equation editor. If you don't know what that means and you can't handle that, then you should not be typing. And I'm gonna explain that one more time. Uh, in other words, uh, soft. I, in, in, if you don't really know what you're doing, then just don't type it up. But we're going to be doing some math. And here's what I don't want to see. I don't want to see people doing 2 times 10 to the power of 6. That's, that looks like garbage and I can't even read it or grade it. If you insist on typing, you need to know how to use an equation editor. Editor, You have to go to insert equation. And if you were doing the small angle formula, S equals, and then you can put in a fraction bar. Uh, you can put in uh, other stuff. You can, put, you can put Greek letters in there. In other words, you've got to go through the trouble to make it look real good, just like if we were writing it out. So there's theta, uh, there's a times button here. I really don't know if I need to belabor this. Theta times D times two, and I think there's a pi. This, do you understand what I'm saying? This is how it needs to look if you're planning on, now here I'm gonna use a fraction bar so I can put degrees in, or actually degrees are probably a symbol three, 360, in other words, You've got to make it good the way it would look if you were writing it. 
somewhere around here. Oh, there's a degree symbol. So that's how the small angle formula needs to look. And, and likewise, other maths as well. If you cannot handle that, then you should probably just be writing it by hand. Another great piece of advice, try to use a sharp pencil for this. If you're using a pen and you make a mistake, you're going to start scribbling it out. And then it's going to look like garbage, not only for me, but remember, we're going to create these perfect homeworks that you can study from for the exam. So you don't want it looking like garbage for you either, because it'll actually make it more confusing. Those are just some pro tips, you know, ignore me if you want, but I, I this ain't my first rodeo. Okay, guys, um, we're going to be doing homework number one. So let's label that so that we can remember which homework we've done. And the homework assignment is five problems from chapter two. Can you guys read me the numbers so I don't have to go look it up? Forty-four. Yep. Forty-eight. Mm-hmm. Fifty-three. Uh -huh. Fifty-seven. And fifty-nine. Okay. That'll just kind of help us keep track of what we're doing here. So our first problem is uh, chapter two, number forty-four. Um, <clears throat> was that you, Kim, that that read that out for me? Yeah. All right, your, your microphone's a little bit distorted. Um, I don't know if that's being too close or being too loud. You can, um, <clears throat> but I was gonna ask if you would read uh, the question for chapter two. If your microphone's a bit hot, which it sounds that way, if you go down to the little arrow next to your mute button, you can click audio settings and you should be able to adjust the volume input level of your microphone. If you bring it down just a hair, it, it might, uh, help with the clipping that you're getting, but I don't know. I can hear you anyways, so. Better? Try it. Is that better? A little bit. Anyways, why don't you go ahead and read us the question for chapter two, number 44. And there's usually a little title in italics. I like to hear the title as well. Okay. New planet. A planet in another solar system has a circular orbit and an axis tilt of 35 degrees. What would you expect this planet to have <clears throat> seasons? I'm sorry, would you expect this planet to have seasons? If so, would you expect them to be more extreme than the seasons on Earth? If not, why not? Okay, actually that did help a little bit. Wait, so let's go over the givens again. It's a circular orbit and what were the other conditions? It has an axis tilt of 35 degrees. And it's, the question is, would you expect this planet to have seasons? Okay. In fact, there's two questions. Uh, in fact, there's three questions, Kim. There's three questions buried in this question. The yeah. first is, would you expect it to have seasons? The second part is, would they be more or less extreme than Earth's, right? Yes. Yeah. And then, and then why or why not? Yeah. And this is important, Kim, um, because I'm I'm teaching you guys how to make a how to solve a problem set and do it like a pro. And for my problem sets, <clears throat> there's often multiple questions buried within the question. It's important that we address all three of them uh, correctly to get all of our points. I'd like to remind you guys that I grade each question out of a possible five points. So in my mind, I even kind of pre-calculate what, what the points are going to be worth. And for this question, I usually, this is a very easy question because it's your first one. I kind of assign two points for addressing that question correctly, two points for that question correctly, and then one point for the why. Of course, since I'm going to be your tour guide through these problems, I'm going to make sure that you get the points as long as you follow along with me. But we have to kind of discuss it and bash it around a bit as if you were trying to do it without me. It's a good exercise. So let's see what you guys have learned so far in my class. We got a new planet, a circular orbit, and an axis tilt of 35 degrees. Let's tackle the, oh, by the way, uh, this type of question is like a word question whose answer should be in a paragraph form. So we should have three or four sentences, sometimes more for our answer. Some of our questions are what I call word questions that require a paragraph or two. 
some of our questions are little math problems that involve a calculation. And, and one of the reasons we're doing this together is so you can see exactly what I want and, and I'm showing you how to do it right with no confusion. So let's start with the first question. Would this planet have seasons? What do you think? <clears throat> Zachary's nodding his head. So talk to me, Zach. Tell me what you're thinking. Uh, since it has a tilt and um, in a circular orbit, it will have seasons. Correct. And since I've got you on the horn here, do you think they're going to be, <coughs> excuse me, more extreme or less extreme than Earth's? Um, what's the uh, what's the the tilt of Earth's uh, axis? Um, that's a great question. Anyone remember what Earth's axis tilt is? I can tell you, but I just want to see if anyone remembered from our lectures. Yeah, Jenna. Um, it's twenty three point five degrees. Excellent. Okay. So it's 23.5 degrees. So does that help you, Zach? I think it'd be more extreme then. Yeah. So answering these two questions is actually pretty straightforward. The explanation of why can be a bit tricky, but we'll give you a chance at that, Zach. Why don't we first start getting our answer down, okay? So let's answer it, and you guys can copy directly after me, okay? Um, a planet with a circular orbit and an axis tilt of 35 degrees would have seasons, would have seasons. The seasons should be more extreme should be more extreme than Earth's as thirty five degrees is greater. than Earth's 23.5 degree axis tilt. So far, I'm enjoying this answer because we have a lot of technical information. We're, we're, we're answering the questions and we're also throwing out there that we, we know what Earth's axis tilt is. It's 23.5 degrees. Now that might sound like a why, but I don't think that's enough. See, we've just mentioned that we know that the seasons are more extreme because the axis tilt is greater than Earth's. And now, Zach, since you kind of put your foot in it and, and made the mistake of, of trying to answer a question, <laughs> um, this, this part I think is complicated. We're just looking for a single sentence to see if you can explain why a 35 degree tilt leads to more, season, more extreme seasons than a 23.5 degree tilt. What is it about the extra tilt that makes the seasons more extreme? Does it have to do with the sunlight, the direction of the sunlight? Uh, the direction of the sunlight? Or, or like the, yes. the amount that it's covering on the earth at a certain time or the planet that we're yeah. talking about? The word that I would probably use, although you mm -hmm. did pretty good, I would talk about the angle of the sunlight. Okay, that's it, yeah. So yeah. remember, if we go back to our seasons um, slideshow when we were discussing that on Monday, I believe, Uh, sorry, here, where are we? Uh, you, were, you were clearly referring to those two pictures that we looked at, but I would talk about uh, the angle of the sunlight, right? Remember, we talked about the angle of the, the sunlight for the two flashlights. It's not about distance, it's about angle. That's what we're trying to say. So, so how should we put this sentence, Zach, if you, if you wanted to try? What should we say about the angle of the sunlight? With a more drastic angle, um, the variation in seasons will be more, I don't know, something like that. Something like that, yeah. The, the variation in the angle of the sunlight mm -hmm. will be more extreme mm -hmm. for the 35 degree tilt. I think something like that is pretty good. Yeah. Let's see if we can wing it here. So we'll say um, the 
the 35 degree axis tilt will lead to more extreme variation in the angle of sunlight. Now, we don't necessarily know that this planet has an orbital period of one year. It could have any old orbital period. So what we'll say is the 35 degree axis tilt will lead to more extreme variation in the angle of sunlight over the course of one orbit. Okay, so that was pretty good. I liked how you went right away to talking about the direct, you said the direction of the sunlight, which was pretty much the same thing. Um, <clears throat> remember, we learned about angles this week, so we're trying to incorporate some of those ideas. And that's, that's a pretty comprehensive answer for that. Albeit that was a simple question, we made, let's think about what we did. We made sure that we addressed all of the questions asked in a clear and efficient way. That's our goal in learning how to be good writers. Explain directly the answer with as simple and few words as possible, but not to omit anything. All right, let me give you a second to catch up to me. I can erase as soon as you guys are ready. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cross out this question. Boom. One down, four to go. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any objections to me racing? You guys are fast, so that's good. <clears throat> Okay, um, Ian, are you down to read me uh, question 48? Sure, one sec. And don't forget, I like to hear the title too. I just, that's um, like that, you know? Let me see if I can find it here. Um, it says, a farther moon. Suppose the distance to the moon were twice its actual value. Would it still be possible to have a total solar eclipse? Why or why not? So, um, the distance is two times farther. It wants to know, could you still have a total solar eclipse? And uh, then it wants to know why, okay? Now, I anticipated this trouble. We, we basically just completed the phases of the moon today. And my very next lecture topic will be eclipses. I didn't quite get there. But remember that I did, I did talk to you guys about uh, a total solar eclipse at some point. I probably showed you, probably showed you uh, this picture here. Let's see if I, if I can find it. This is a picture, and I'll show this again next time. Of, of a total solar eclipse. A total solar eclipse is where the full disk of the moon completely blocks the full disk of the sun. And you can usually see a bit of eerie light from the outer layers of the sun called the, the corona. But basically, the sun is completely blocked. And the other types of eclipses, the other types of solar eclipses, a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse could be contrasted to a partial solar eclipse where there's not a perfect alignment and then you kind of get a bite taken out of the sun. Uh, I also might have mentioned that sometimes the moon has an eclipse when it's a little bit farther away and then you can get an annular eclipse where you don't block out the full disk of the sun. So I don't know if I talked about those, but that's a little, you know, that's, that's the three types of solar eclipses in a nutshell. There are also lunar eclipses. We'll get to that later. OK, so uh, to me, this seems like a very straightforward question, but I don't know if, if you guys feel the same way. Uh, Ian or anyone else, do you know what the answer is? If the moon is, 
if the moon had formed twice as far from Earth as it as it is, is today, if it had been say 800,000 kilometers instead of 400,000 kilometers, could you still have a total solar eclipse? I mean, I don't really have a strong basis for this, but I'm going to say no because it just wouldn't cover up as much of the sun. That's that's exactly right. What what would change? What aspect of the moon would change if it was twice as far away? Just the way it. Uh, w wouldn't it be cool if we had a nice seconds fancy... or minutes? Yeah. What do we call that again? The uh, bu 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 the um. Oh, what is that? I wrote it down. <laughs> We're looking for a for a buzzword from our class here, a, a vocabulary word. If only we had good words to describe how big moon look on sky. You know what 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 is that? What do we call that? Angular size. Oh shit! Right, the angular size. So what would happen to the angular size of the moon if it was twice as far away? It would it would half itself. Yeah, and today, of course, you know that the angular size of the moon, Ian, is. I muted myself. It's a half degree. So if it was twice as far away, it would probably shrink to about a quarter degree. Yeah. And that means it would probably look, you know, this would be the sun. And if the moon was like half of its size, that's probably, that's probably what the eclipse would look like, right? So that's certainly not a total solar eclipse. That's probably more like an annular eclipse, although it's a pretty wacky it's a pretty extreme annular eclipse, all right? All right, so let's write our answer down. If the moon was twice as far as it is today, I guess we should have probably said twice as far from Earth, as it is today, then no, a total solar eclipse would not be possible. Now we'll explain why using your term angular size. This is because the <clears throat> angular size of the moon would shrink to 0.25 degrees. You yourself deduced that, Ian. And no longer cover what I would call the full disk of the sun. That's how we talk. That's how we use our words right there. Um, I'm going to add in one last sentence for completeness. This isn't strictly necessary, but since we're doing this together, we might as well do it with style. We'll add <clears throat> instead, you'd get an annular eclipse. This is just demonstrating that we know our different types of eclipses. So that's that's some bonus answer material. <clears throat> Let's see how we're doing here. All right. Okay, uh, 
I'm going to erase unless anyone has an objection to that. Just one quick second. I'm sorry. I'm just copying the bottom part. What you That's OK. That's why I asked. Just let me know when you're done. <coughs> I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Here I go. Uh, two down. So, uh, who, let's see, who should I pick on next? Um, Adriana, I haven't heard from you today. Are you, are you down to read a question for me? Sure. Awesome. So why don't you go ahead and uh, read out number, uh, chapter two, number 53. Okay, so the title is Arc Minutes and Arc Seconds. Okay. And there are 360 degrees in a first full circle. A, how many arc minutes are in a full circle? B, how many arc seconds are in a full cir circle? And C, the moon's angular size is about 0 0.5 degrees. What is this in arc minutes and in arc seconds? Okay. So anytime a question has parts A, B, and C, we're going to want to label those parts A, B, and C. So let's start with part A. And uh, remind me, Adriana, it said... Um, it said, how many arc minutes are in a full, full circle? Okay, how do you think we should go about this, uh, Adriana? I'm not completely sure. <laughs> okay, let me tell you what the answer is, or let me tell you what your answer should be. We're going to use dimensional analysis, okay? That's the way we solve these problems. Because effectively, this is a unit conversion problem. So Adriana, um, if you were here, last class which i think you were go ahead and oh you weren't here last class no i wasn't i had oh. another class bloody hell <laughs> well i don't know if you got around to watching the video but i did something really important to that class i taught everyone the four steps of dimensional analysis and they had to write it down in their notebook now this is something that if you did not see it because another class you need to go back and painful as it is take the time to watch that video and take those notes down okay um, let's see who does have it. Uh, Nori, were you here last time? Um, no, but I did watch um, the video. Did you take notes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So could you open up your notebook? Let's go to the four steps of dimensional analysis. And what I want you to do, Nori, because this is, I've discovered this is a good way to train you guys. Nori, I want you to just kind of read me the first step, and that's how we're going to go about doing this. Um, write down the number to convert with its units. Nice. So Nori says, write down the number to convert with its units. Now, Nori, I guess I could, I'm talking to you now. What number do you think I should mm -hmm. write down? Um, just give me a second. I'm just moving real quick. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my family was just talking. I understand. <laughs> it's one of the things you learn when doing work from home is it's so important to have a little sacred space where you can concentrate. It's yeah, I was trying to keep my grandmother company for a second, and then my aunt came in, so I was just like, okay, too too many things. <laughs> uh, I understand. I understand. Um. So yeah, let me just pull it up real quick. Yeah, get yourself situated. And we can also uh, talk back to Adriana too. So Adriana, do you know what number we're trying to convert in this problem while Nori's getting situated? Is it, hang on. Are we doing like arc minutes to degrees? Well, so or this is the question. We have to know what we're trying to convert. The, the statement was, 
the first step of dimensional analysis analysis is you have to write down the number you're trying to convert with its units. So I want to see if you guys can figure that out. What number am I trying to convert? 360. 360 degrees. Thank you. Yep. That's what we're writing down. The number we're trying to convert, and, and by the way, the point that I just made there, I hope you guys understand, the point is sometimes it's hard to get started. Sometimes you can get confused just trying to figure out what the hell you're trying to convert. They asked you how many arc minutes were in one circle. Be the one. Wanted me to take you back with open region all. And I can't do that, mommy. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, Nori, what's step two of dimensional analysis? Wait, um, Nori, you're muted. Multiply by a division bar. All right, that's not too hard. We can do that. Nori, what's step three of dimensional analysis? Put the units in first to cancel. All right, let's see what you learned, Nori. That's your job. Uh, I need to put some units in the top and some units in the bottom. What do you think we should do? Um, are we putting the the 150 times 10 to the sixth power, or we're not doing that. You do not have permission to give me any numbers. You have not earned that right yet. Step three of dimensional analysis is a sacred step. You put the units in first. You do not have okay. permission to touch a number. Okay. I want a unit on the top and a unit on the bottom. Can you figure out what, what okay. I want? Um. And if, well, if you want else, arc minutes, right? Oh, yeah, where do I want to put the arc minutes? Um, at the top. Okay. What would I put at the bottom then? Um, you'd put a degree. That's right. To cross it out. Exactly. Nicely done. The degrees on top need to cancel with degrees on the bottom. Let's go ahead and remind ourselves that's why we did that. So I'm going to lightly cross out the degrees so that they cancel. That's step three. You will, and Nori, I'm proud of you. You didn't make the lecture, but you went and you did your due diligence. You watched the video and you took notes. And I want to say to all you people out there in the studio audience, especially people watching later, that's what you're effing supposed to do. You're supposed to watch those videos and take those notes. If you don't do it, Expect to be confused, okay? All right, step four, Nori. What's step four? Um, the number in second using conversion factors. Okay, in other words, now you've earned the right down. To the numbers in. Nori, I'm gonna need a number on the top and a number on the bottom, but we have to use our conversion factors. Do you have a conversion factor somewhere for mm -hmm. degrees to our minutes i thought i might have given you something like that but i can't can't remember i remember writing it down i'm just trying to like find where it find is yeah. it somewhere so this exercise also teaches us that when we're taking notes we have to take them in such a way where we can find that stuff i usually try to box things and put stars next to them when i feel like they're important mm -hmm. uh, any anyone else in the studio audience feel free to chime in here if you know what to do What's One our degree uh, equals 60 arc minutes. Excellent. I'm going to write that down over on the side. Somewhere in there, Nori, it should say one degree mm -hmm. is equal to 60 arc minutes. That's your... Yep. Okay, so Nori, keep going. I, I'm, I'm still working with you here just because I'm talking to you. Take a guess. Which number goes top? Which number goes bottom? Um, 60 goes on top. That's right. And what goes on the bottom? Oh, one. Exactly. And let's just remind, I'm not just talking to Nori here. I'm talking to all of you. She made sure to keep the number with the units. 60 goes next to the arc minutes. One goes next to the degree. Okay. Take out your calculators and punch them up. That's your job. Your job is to punch them up. And tell me what you get.
Looks good, Jenna. Read it out to me. Sorry, you're muted, Jenna. Yep. Um, 21,600. Good. And the units? Oh, um, arc minutes. Excellent. And the abbreviation for arc minute is an apostrophe. Let's put a box around it because that's kind of a classy move. Okay, guys. Part A, down the hatch. Um, who is our reader there? Uh, uh, where is she? Uh, Adriana, could you read us Part B again? Because I've forgotten. Yeah. Um, the next one is, how many arc seconds are in a full circle? OK. So I don't know if you're ready to handle this yet, but let's pick on you, Adriana, OK? So obviously you didn't get down those four steps of dimensional analysis, but you, you just kind of saw them in action. So let's see if you can now do the same thing that, that Nori just did. The first step is to write down the number to convert with its units. What should we write down, Adriana? Would it be 360 degrees? We can start from there again. Absolutely. There's a couple of different ways to skin this cat, but let's do it your way. I think that's going to be helpful. So we'll start with 360 degrees. Okay, step two is to multiply by a division bar. I got you. That's not hard. Now comes the hard part, Adriana. Step three is to put the units in first to cancel. So Adriana, I need a unit on the top and I need a unit on the bottom. What do you think we should do? Degrees on the bottom. Definitely. And would we have to go to arc, min arc minutes first and then arc seconds? Exactly. I was going to see if you would figure that out. And you are a, uh, you are good. I'm, I'm impressed that you figured that out. We can't go directly to arc seconds because we don't have a conversion factor. What's our conversion, fa who is our conversion factor guy? Someone shouted that out. Uh, Zach, what's our conversion factor from arc seconds to arc minutes? One arc second is, no, uh, no, no. I mean, one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. Right. Remember, everyone, the abbreviation for arc seconds is uh, uh, quotation marks there. So, <clears throat> Adriana, we don't have degrees directly to arc seconds. I mean, we could figure it out. It's not that complicated. But let's just kind of play along here. So first, we'll have to go to arc minutes. Uh, that does cancel out our degrees. And then... You're exactly right, Adriana. We're going to have to do this again. We go back to step two. We put in another division bar. Now, Adriana, give me the units for the second uh, division bar. It would be arc minutes on the bottom and arc seconds on the top. Excellent. OK, and notice that I like to do all of the stage three stuff. I like to get all of my units in there and then put the numbers at the very end. That's kind of a cool way to do things. OK, so now, Adriana, let's see if you can fill in those numbers. I need a number top and bottom for both of these division bars. So one on the bottom and 60 on top. Yep. And, and then here. would it be the same 60 on top, one on the bottom? Exactly, because there are 60 arc seconds in one arc minute. So 60 arc seconds in one arc minute. OK, guys, punch them up to 360 times 60 times 60. What you got? <clears throat> Anyone who gets it, feel free to just shout it out. One million two hundred ninety six thousand. OK, and Zach, I believe we've got a rule about numbers bigger than one million, right? Yeah, the scientific notation rule. All right, so tell me what to, to write. Um, one sec. <coughs> um, this, would it be 1.296 uh, times, what is it? Is it 10? Oh, 10 to the, OK, and then it goes 1, 2, one, two, three, four, five, six to the six power. Exactly. That's a million. And then don't forget, we need to put arc seconds 
Mm -hmm. Don't make it look like 611. Make sure those arc seconds look not like a number, okay? Okay. And then box it because that's a classy move. Nicely done. All right. Now it's time for part C. Um, <clears throat> uh, Adriana, could you remind us what part C says? Yep. It says the moon's angular size is about 0 0.5 degrees. What is this in arc minutes and in arc seconds? Okay, Valentina, I want to hear from you if that's okay. What do you think we should do, Valentina? We need to convert this first into arc minutes and then into arc seconds. We should do what we did on step one, SMA. Right, so step so, one is to write down the number to convert with its units. So we're gonna write 0 0.5 degrees. Okay, and I'll just start with that here since I've got that. And now what's step two, uh, Valentina? Uh, multiply by a division bar. I love it. And now step three, Valentina? It will be our units. That's going to be degrees on the bottom and our minutes on top. Lovely. Uh, you, you make it seem so easy, Valentina. OK, now let's put in our numbers. That's step four. It will be 60 on top and one at the bottom. Nice. Um, and so can you do that in your head or do you want to do that in your calculator? 0. 0.5 times 60, what should that give us? 30. And the units? Our minutes. Nice. Put a box around that. Now, unlike part B, where Adriana went back uh, to 360, this time we'll do it a different way. We'll start with our 30 arc minutes and we'll convert that to arc seconds. So Kim, uh, are you down to help me do that? I just wanna give you all practice doing it out loud. Okay, so Kim, tell me what to do. Sorry, my dogs were fighting. <laughs> <laughs> they decided at this moment to do that. Okay, we're gonna do 0.5 times hold on hold on kim i got two components okay. first of all when you say 0.5 you always have to tell degree me sorry you. but kim i had a different idea we already i want to try this a different way than what we did up here we already okay. converted the 0.5 degrees into 30 arc minutes right yep yeah so why, why don't we start with that and then go to arc seconds that'll save us a move okay so, so I'll write down. You, you so we're going to do 30, 30 arc minutes. OK. Yep. And then it'd be times division bar. Yep. Um, degree, um, arc minutes would be on the bottom. Correct. Arc seconds on the top. Correct. And it would be 60 and on top and one on the bottom. Beautiful. I like your moves. So punch them up and tell me what you get. Eighteen hundred. And the units? Arc seconds. Arc seconds. Yep. And then box that up because that's a classy move. Nice. So that's, you guys did pretty good at that. I'm, I'm impressed uh, with a little bit of prodding. You two can do the dimensional analysis. All right, I like it. Take a moment to make sure you all got that. And that's three down, two to go. This is a nice gentle introduction to how we do homeworks. And this is what a good problem set looks like. This is how you do it with style. <clears throat> well, I'm ready to erase if you guys are. Any, anyone need another minute here? Or? Okay, I'm erasing. Um, I had a quick question, actually. Sure. Yeah, ask away. For the, for the last one, um, 
if it just asked for like straight arc seconds and not like arc minutes, we would just do like 0.5 degrees times 60 over one times and 60 over one, but with right. it's like proper. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I, there's only so much time in a day, Nori. Eventually mm -hmm. what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you another conversion factor, which if you think about it, 60 times 60 is 3,600. So as you guys mm -hmm. get a little more comfortable, We'll probably in the future convert right from degrees to arc seconds using another conversion factor. One degree is equal to mm -hmm. 3,600 arc seconds. Because time is limited and it takes a long time to explain even the simplest things. Oh, nice kid. What's mm -hmm. that guy's name? Is Willow. That a, is that a cat? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow, what a cool face. That's a crazy looking yeah. cat. Yeah. Awesome. Willow is my She doesn't friend. shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I know how cats are. They want attention, right? Um, okay, so in, any, in other words, we could do it this way, or we could also, if we know the number of arc seconds per degree, we could do it that way. As you guys get stronger, I'll take the training wheels off a little more and we'll move faster. All right, I'm erasing. All right. Um, let's see who hasn't read for me yet. Uh, I can't remember. Zach, did you read for me? You did. I want to um, hear it. You want to hear me? Yeah. Who's you? Zach. Yes. All right. What, uh, what question is it? Which one? Um, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. 57. 57. Okay. So it says sun diameter, uh, use the sun's approximate distance of 150 million kilometers an angular diameter of about 0.5 degrees to calculate the sun's physical diameter. Okay, I hate how says, they say angular diameter. They should have said angular size. There's no need yeah. to confuse you guys, but you know, sometimes- and It says, compare your answer to the actual value value of 1,390,000 uh, 1, kilometers. Um, they give us the angular size of 0.5 degrees. And you said the, uh, the distance was what? Uh, 150 million kilometers. How should I write that down? Because I think if I remember the text, they actually write the word million, right? Can you put yeah. that in the scientific notation for me, Zach? Uh, 1.5. Uh, uh, right? Is that 1.5 times 10 to the... There's a better way to do this, you know. Zach, did you take down that table that I wrote on the first day? Yeah, which table? 10? Why don't we just write it as 150 and then you can substitute the right power of 10. It was, see, it was gonna take you a little bit of mental work to figure out how to move the decimal place. But if you know what the word million means as a power of 10, you can do this so much faster. 150. Yeah. What do, you, what do you want me to say? The number of zeros in a million. Um, uh, six. So 150 times 10 to the six kilometers. Yeah. That's the distance. They also want us, after we calculate it, to compare to the book value. And what do they give us for a book value? Um, 1,390,000 kilometers. One million three hundred and ninety thousand. Oh, oh so, yeah. Sorry. So one point three nine million kilometers. Sorry, I got confused for a second there. No, you good. You good. And I put it right into scientific notation. Um, most of you guys don't have a lot of experience solving problems. Solving these kinds of problems are at the heart of what a an astronomy or a physics or a science type education is all about. Um, and, and when you get these problems, the smart thing to do is to extract all of the info that they give you. These are what are called the givens. So I'm teaching you a little bit about the lore of problem solving here. A smart move is to extract the givens. Usually the givens are what you have to work with to solve the problem. But sometimes as problem solving gets more advanced, the givens are not always given. Sometimes the givens are implied. You're not ready for that yet, but we'll get there soon enough. 
Sometimes you're supposed to know what the givens are. That's when it really becomes an art form. Right now, they're giving you all the givens. We wrote them down. Now we need a, a method. How are we going to find the sun's diameter? Maybe we should kind of write this problem out again. Okay, so we're, well, actually, first of all, does anyone know what to do? Do we use the small angle formula? Exactly, Jenna. Jenna, since you guys are in the learning stage, we're also going to draw the diagram again, OK? So we'll make a short little version of the diagram. Draw the sun over here as a small disk. The diameter of the disk is s. And then you're the observer on Earth who's viewing it as an angle. And you also know the distance. And let's go ahead and rewrite the small angle formula out. The size is the angular size times the distance times 2 pi over 360 degrees. So Jenna, you seem to know what's up. What should I do next? OK, uh, now we plug in the numbers into the formula. Pretty much that easy. So let's write it again. S equals 0.5 degrees times 150 million kilometers times 2 times pi over 360 degrees. Now listen, class, at the beginning of our lecture today, I walked you through how to punch this in. I think it'll be interesting to see how many of you can get this without me showing it to you. So why don't you all take a minute, see if you can punch that all in. Don't forget to use your EXP key right there. Nobody should be typing times 10. Times 10 is for losers. Winners use the EXP key, okay? Why don't you guys go ahead and punch this and see if you can handle it? I'm guessing, I'm, I don't know if all of you, I'm just, I have no idea what you guys can do. So just show me what you can do. See if you can punch it in and get me an answer. Go you ahead, Jenna. Hold, hold that right up to the screen, Jenna. Show me what you got. You did it right. What, what about the rest of you? Nicely done, Valentina. You got it, Ian. Good, Adriana. Uh, a little closer, Kim. Uh, I think you got it right. It's a little dark. Yeah, I you think you got that. How about Ryan? Ryan, I forgot to pick on you today. What do you got, Ryan? Oh, you're using that thing. What? Show it to me anyway. Okay. Ryan, you got it. Nori, how about you? I can't hear you, Nori. Okay, right. My calculator is actually downstairs, so I can't really. I'm trying to plug it in on my phone real quick. Oh, geez. What? Why is your calculator yeah. downstairs? Did you come? Because I, I was rushing upstairs to try and get away from them because they oh, were that's talking. Right. That's right. Now, Ryan had an answer, and it looks like Ryan got the right answer, but I don't like the way Ryan formatted it for me. Ryan has done three things to offend me, and why don't we list them all? First, he didn't put any units. Second, he didn't round his number. And third, he didn't put it into scientific notation. All of those things are highly offensive to me. And if you all just want to see what offends me, go ahead right now and just click on the chat and look at what Ryan wrote down. And also, let's talk about a fourth thing. He, he made a typographic error as well. That's not actually the right answer. OK, who did get the right answer and knows how to format it in a way that I'm going to like. Jenna, you want to try? Yeah. Um, so we'll do two sig figs. Um, how did you know two sig figs? What told you that, Jenna? Well, I remember you said it was kind of a general rule of thumb. It is a general rule of thumb. Um, um, also, the 360 degrees is. Uh, 360 degrees, two and pi are not significant figures. They are okay. perfect numbers. 
This is actually, an, this is a level two discussion, Jenna. And I've got the feeling that you might be ready for this level two discussion. Maybe the rest of you guys are too. Jenna, measurement error comes in when you have measurements. The angular size of the moon, one of the variables, that's a measurement. And the, the distance to the moon, that's a variable and that's also a measurement. Some scientists had to go out and get these numbers. The reason, Jenna, that these numbers are perfect is those two pi 360, they're not measurements, but they're conceptual ideas. For instance, Jenna, the Greeks defined a degree as a 360th of a circle. And I wanna go back here to see if I can, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make this point, but I'm gonna try. Because we define a degree as exactly Eh, function F535, sorry, I can't multitask. Function F535, okay. Because a degree is, is defined as exactly one 360th of a circle, the 360 degrees is a perfect number because there are exactly with infinite precision 360 degrees. That's not determined by anyone's ability to measure that's an abstract ideal division into a perfect 300. Do you see what I mean? Likewise, the number two comes because the radius is half of the diameter and that's a perfect two. So 360 degrees does not have precision. Now, Jenna, in fact, if we were gonna be really hardcore, how many sig figs does this number have? Just one. Yeah, it's just one. This has two, but now here I'm gonna tell you something. Now that you've learned the proper way to do things, we're gonna break the rules, Jenna. And here's why we're gonna break the rules. I happen to know that, that the half a degree is actually good to probably just about two sig figs. That's kind of a lie too. But the real issue here, Jenna, is we're asked to compare to the book value, right? And you'll notice that the book value has three sig figs. It doesn't really work when you try to compare two numbers with different levels of precision. So even though, Jenna, you, oh, Kim, what's that cat's name? I like seeing your animals. What's that guy? Oh, is that a dog? What is that thing? I can't hear you, but I wanna see it. It looks cute as hell. Is that a dog? <laughs> it's a, it's a cat. It's, it's a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, was, you're, you're a little tiny dog on my screen there. <laughs> He wanted some attention. <laughs> What's that guy's name? Lunatic. <laughs> Does the name fit? Yes. <laughs> All right, we want to see more of that lunatic. Okay, so you keep you keep bringing him around. Her. Any? Oh, her. Sorry. Uh, anyways, Jenna, why don't you give me, to make a long story short, give me three sig figs, okay? Okay. Um, one three zero. No, don't talk to me like a robot. Is the number bigger than a million, yes or no? Yes, it is bigger than a million. Then I expect you to put it in scientific notation. Try again. Okay, um, 1.30, oh, 1.31. There you go, now you're talking. Yep. Um, times 10 to the sixth. Good, and now my units? Kilometers. That's good. We kept a little more, you are right, Jenna. Your original idea of when in doubt, choose two sig figs, that's almost always the right answer. Here, it's a little weird because I wanted to keep the same level of precision to compare, okay? So we're cheating a little bit. Put a box around it. You have now earned four out of five points. It's time to compare to the book value. In this class, when we are asked to compare two numbers, you are not supposed to say, oh gee, this one's bigger and that one's smaller, nor are you supposed to subtract. When we compare numbers, we take the ratio. Now taking the ratio is an art form. Sometimes you wanna do the big guy divided by the little guy. Sometimes you wanna do the little guy divided by the big guy. You have to know what to do based on good taste. Since this number is just slightly less than that number, I'm going to ask the question, what percentage of the book's value did we get? So I'm going to do it like this. 
the size of the sun that we got divided by the size of the book value is 1.31 million kilometers divided by 1.39 million kilometers. Go ahead and punch that up for me and tell me what you get. This time, Jenna, I'm going to cheat again and I'm going to round back to two sig figs for style. What'd you get? Just read it to me, Jenna. Read me the answer. You're muted. I keep doing that. Um, 0.94 kilometers. Aha, uh -huh. okay, let's talk about this. Some, okay. some issues of style, Jenna. Mm -hmm. Whenever a number is less than zero, we should always write out the lead, the, 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 the zero in front of it. So let's do 0 0.94. I like the way that you rounded. Okay. Make sure you always put your zero out front, 0 0.94. I don't like the kilometer thing, Jenna, because if you look at dimensional analysis, kilometers on top will cancel kilometers on the bottom this number is unitless. What does the number mean, Jenna? Like 94%, 94 out of 100? That's right, 94% of the book value. So let's write that next to it. So 0.94 means 94% of the book value. Nicely done. And that takes care of 57. We got one last question to go. Um, I'm ready to erase if you guys are. See how we're doing on time. We got one last question. Not too bad. <clears throat> um, I'm going to erase. All right, guys, we have one question left before we're done, but I, I hate to say it, I saved, I saved the worst for last. The last one's gonna, we're gonna take the gloves off and slap you around a little bit. This question's kind of intense, but it, it's not undoable. Hey, Ryan, um, I didn't really get to hear from you yet. Do you feel up to reading this last question? There's a lot of stuff in it. Uh, yeah, I, I guess. Well, let's, let's, give it a, let's give it a whack a doodle. Um, it's chapter two, number 59. And what's the title? Eclipse Conditions. Eclipse Conditions. My marker is starting to kick out here. Uh, hold on a second. Let me get a fresh one because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on here. Okay, Ryan, give it to me straight. Uh, the moon per the moon's precise equ. Uh, let me help you there. Before, e equatorial. Equatorial. Uh, can't speak English half the time. Okay. <laughs> Diameter is 3,476 kilometers, and its orbital distance from the Earth varies between 356,400 and 406,700 kilometers. Hold on, hold on. You can slow that down. What was the first distance? 357,400 kilometers. Wait, 357,000? Okay. 357,400 kilometers. And no, it's 56, sorry. 
Oh, okay. Hold on. We got to get this straight here. Uh, 356,400 kilometers. Is that right? Yes. And the other distance? 406,700 uh, four kilometers. Okay. In other words, 406,700 kilometers. Okay. That's okay. Part of this reading is practicing saying all this crazy shit. Continue. The sun's diameter is. Uh, hold on, let me just convert this real quick. Well, hold on a second. What? Uh, let me look at the screen here. Let me see what you're seeing. Because it's over a million, so. Would... I, I, yeah, I do want to put that in a scientific notation. I thought about asking you that. What's what are the what does the word say here? Uh, it says so. So this says one million. 390,000 kilometers, right? Yes. But Ryan, I would call it 1.39 million. That's another way to say it. How do I put that into scientific notation again? It would be 1.39 times 10 to the six. Kilometers, good, okay. Kilometers, yeah. Now give me the distances. It's distances from Earth range between 147.5 and 152.6 million kilometers. So that would be, each one would be 400 point. No, no, no. 147.5 times. And wherever the word million appears, we just swap out 10 to the six. Okay, that's how we do this. Yep, 10 to the six. Okay. okay. So we have quite a few givens. We have the diameter of the sun and moon. We have the distances. What does it ask us to do in part A? Or what does it ask us to do after that? Part A, find the moon's angular size at its maximum and at its minimum and maximum distance from the Earth. OK, let's just stop there. Class, this is a problem that is supposed to use the small angle formula. But unlike the previous problem where we calculated the diameter, now they're giving us the diameter. So let's explain what's going on here. They're giving us the diameter of the sun and the moon. And they're giving us the variations in distance. This is distance one, that's distance two. And they want us to rearrange the small angle formula to solve for the angular size. Now, if you rearrange the small angle formula and do some algebra, I'm going to skip the, 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 the algebra part because you probably don't give a shit and you're not going to remember it anyways. You end up rearranging the formula to get this formula for angular size. This is an important formula because I'm going to expect you to use this as well, both in homeworks and in the exams. And the way I like to write it is that the angular size of your object is 360 degrees over 2 times pi times the size divided by the diameter. So this is a formula that's the same thing as the small angle formula, but we've rearranged it for angular size. And we're going to need to use this formula four times in this problem. We're going to calculate the angular size of the moon at its minimum distance. We're going to calculate the angular size of the moon at its maximum distance. And then in part B, we're going to calculate the angular size of the sun at its minimum and maximum distances. It sounds like a lot of work, but as long as we keep it organized, it'll go pretty quick. Unfortunately, I'm kind of running out of board space. I'm going to need quite a bit. So make sure you get this down because I kind of have to erase this to go forward. Otherwise, I'm going to smush into the bottom of the board. Ryan, you were reading. So did you have time to copy all this? Yes, I did. Oh, good. All right, you guys are fast. Uh, I'm going to erase unless anyone tells me otherwise. You guys seem to be quick at that, so that's good. All right, make sure you have all those numbers because I'm going to need you to repeat them to me. 
Ryan, I believe part A says you find the angular size of the moon at, do they say minimum and maximum or maximum and minimum? Minimum first and maximum. Okay. So first we're going to do the moon and we're going to do the min distance. So let's go ahead and set up our formula. Um, for minimum distance, we have angular size is 360 degrees over two times pi. Um, what did we have for the diameter of the moon? Diana was. Uh, would that be the three hundred three thousand four hundred seventy six kilometers? Yep. So thirty four seventy six kilometers. And now we need the minimum distance to the moon. Three hundred fifty six thousand four hundred kilometers. Okay. Now it's time to punch this in. And this is a tricky part, believe it or not. Most of you are not going to do this right. So I need to talk to you about how we punch this in. Let's talk general strategies for a second. Uh, I used to have a little dowel pointer stick here. Let me game out what we're going to do. Do you see how 2 and pi are both at the bottom of the fraction bar? That's a tricky bit when you punch it into your calculator. You cannot do 360 divided by 2 times pi. You'll totally get it wrong. When we punch it in, we're going to do 360 divide by 2, divide by pi. Then we'll multiply by 3476. Then we'll divide by 356400. Since this is your first time doing a tricky calculation, I'm going to kind of show you, and I want you to follow along with me as I punch it in, OK? So we're going to do 360 divide by 2, divide by pi times 3476 divide by 356400 and then equals. Show me that this is what you got in your calculator. I want to see that you guys got that right. Hold on, let me let me change the view here. Adriana, good. Zach, good. Jenna, good. Valentina, good. Uh, Kim, that looks good. I'd love to see um, Ryan and Nori. I think Nori went to get her calculator. Ryan, how'd you do? I know you're working with the funky one today. Yeah, I, I messed up on something. I didn't get the same number. I'm gonna try. And hey, all you trolls that are hiding there in the background, you little trolls, just because you're a troll doesn't mean you don't have to punch it. If you're not punching it, then you're wasting your time, OK? Punching is what this is all about. Nori, did you want to give that a whack? All right, see if you can punch that in quick, quick, like a bunny. OK, guys, um, why don't we talk to our resident rounding expert, Jenna. Jenna, what do you think we, all right, Jenna, you seem to know what's up with the rounding thing. So why don't you school these uh, mofos on what's up here? How many, uh, how many sig figs do you think we should keep in our answer, Jenna? I think four. Exactly. How'd you know four? Um, because both distances and kilometers have four sig figs. Excellent. And these don't count because they're perfect, right? Yeah. You've learned your lessons well. So why don't you go ahead and tell me what I should write down for my final answer? OK. Um, 0 0.5589. Wait, one. Do you have rounding issues? Look, after the eight is a one. Oh, okay. I got an eight after my second eight. Well, that's wacky. Why wouldn't we have the same thing? Didn't we punch in the same numbers? No, no, no. You're, you're reading it wrong. Oh, oh, I'm reading. Okay. I'm sorry. It is eight. It's still eight. Right. Because the number that we're cutting is, is less than five. And what yep. are my units? um degrees excellent kilometers cancel top and bottom okay now um, do you tell me if i if i did this right uh yeah who's who's you who is who am i talking to oh nori, nori. uh nori show me your calc key. i hope you can see it 
It's really uh, shitty with the glare. What? No. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw it for a second, but then the the solar panel wasn't getting enough light. So hold it up real quick. Closer. I don't know. I can't even see it. The reason it's... why is because when you hold it up to the screen, you're blocking the sunlight or what little light is in that room, and so it's it's mm -hmm. not getting enough light. You have to. Sh why don't you just? Well, hey Nori, do you get this? Yeah, and then it's like one zero six eight. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's all junk numbers. Those aren't real. The only parts of this number okay. that are real are zero point five five eight eight. The rest of that is okay. just trash. Okay. Okay. All right. Now we're going to do the maximum distance. Second verse, same as the first. So this time we're going to do theta equals 360 degrees over 2 times pi. The diameter of the moon has not changed. So on the top, we're still going to have 3476 kilometers. But now, Ryan, we need the maximum distance. What's the maximum distance? That would be 406,700 kilometers. OK. This time, guys, see if you can punch it in without my help. And uh, this time, since uh, Jenna did the rounding right, I don't know, Ian, maybe you could tell me what you get and, and round it up for me, if you don't mind. I said, sorry, give me one second. I have to put yep. it in. Yep. Um, do you want me to read it or just show you? I want you to read it and I want you to round it and I want you to just give me the answer. Okay. Um, I got 0.4897. 0. Point. Yeah, 0. 0.4897. And the units? Uh, degrees. Okay. Let me just verify that you rounded that correctly. Please do. I'm assuming you did, but you know, uh, I can do this pretty snappy. So, yes, you awesome. did that correctly. Excellent. Box it up. That's a classy move. Okay, that covers part A. Now, Ryan. I don't remember if you read the whole thing, but part B just asks us to do the exact same thing, but for the sun, right? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, first of all, do you guys have all this? Because I need to use this board space. All right. I'm going to cheat. Oh, no. Yudi, take your time. Let me know. Yudi, let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm all set now. Awesome. Thank you. Guys, I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little bit. You guys can't do this cuz you're on a piece of paper. I'm going to kind of use my setup here. And you guys should start anew with part B for the sun. But we want to have the exact same format. So the way I'm going to cheat is I'm just going to swap out my numbers. So I, I don't have to write everything out again. You guys will have to write it out. So set it up just like this. And um, I guess, Ryan, since you were our reader, what did you have for the diameter of the sun? 1.39 times 10 to the 6th power. Units? Uh, kilometers, sorry. Okay, so we're going to have that for both. The, the diameter of the sun is fixed. Okay. And what did you have for your minimum distance, Ryan? 
I had 147.5 times 10 to the six kilometers. Okay. And what did you have for your maximum distance? 152.6 times 10 to the six. Kilometers. Kilometers. Yeah. All right. Put them in and punch them up and tell me what your answers are. Zach, how many sig figs should we keep for our final answer, Zach? Three. Exactly. Three. We're going to keep uh, only three this time. So go ahead and whoever gets it first, just shout at me what the answer is. Um, I actually have a question real quick. Sure. Um, when you say sig figs, um, do you mean like, are we using the distance from Earth? Like, are we going to use like the 147.5? Is that why? So Nori, um, this was explained during the lab session, but you may have everything. Yeah, I, I kind of like didn't really get that. I tried to like some sometimes I understand it like when you're talking about it and then other times I'm just like wait I I didn't so right. and that's yeah. that's to be expected that's going to happen and what's cool about the live session one of the reasons I am taking the time to do this live with you again is because mm -hmm. it really helps sometimes to be able to ask those questions and what I like about you Nori is you're not afraid to say hey wait a minute I didn't quite get that can we talk about it and that's not just helpful to you that's helpful to others so let's let's do that here the issue, the key thing that you're probably missing is that we always base our number of significant figures off the crappiest number, the weakest number, because okay. you can think of it as the weakest number pollutes your answer. It, it pollutes the quality. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're gonna take uh, the average of a bunch of heights, let's say you measured my height five times, if one of those measurements is crude, if it's only two sig figs of goodness, the average mm -hmm. will be polluted by that crude number because you didn't have more precision. In this case, the number on top has three significant figures, one, three, and nine. The one on the bottom has four significant figures, one, four, seven, and five. Oh, and it's not like, then I thought it was like the numbers like after the decimal point or right, that's before a, that's it. And I was trying to like piece it. That's a common misconception. You're so used to adding up dollars and cents at your freaking sandwich hut job or whatever that everyone's obsessed with money and they think that precision means how many coins and pennies are you adding up. It's not like that at all because not all numbers have a decimal point, right? The yeah. number 1200, for instance, that has two significant figures. The one and the two give you information about the measurement. The zeros don't. So that's an example of precision without a decimal point, right? To learn how sig figs work, there are rules for it, but I found that when I tried to tell people the rules, they kind of just zoned out. So what I do instead is I just keep showing you different examples as we go, okay? When you have numbers that are less than one, the zero point that number is not a significant figure, okay? Uh, but the numbers that come after it are, that number has three sig figs, for instance, right? Anyway, anyways, let, let's just learn by example. Let's start with this one. Some people were shouting at me in text. What's our first, what's our first uh, answer for the minimum distance? What do you got? Anyone? Um, I got 0 0.540 degrees. Nice. Okay. And how about for the second one? For maximum 0 0.522 degrees. Nice. And those numbers both have three significant figures. Okay. 
But if say the zero was like a one, it would be four. Zero. Which zero? Um, the one before the point. Yeah, if that was a one, that would, would be that would be four one. significant figures. You want to hear another weird one? If instead it was this. That number only has two significant figures. I think okay. I jumped into something. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What'd you jump into? Like a pile of leaves or what? No, I think oh. I jumped into this class. I was like, oh, it's still going. Oh, yeah. You, you caught us right at the tail end, Jonathan. Right at the tail <laughs> end. That's so Yeah, because you had to go work on a plane, right? Yeah, we did. That's hardcore, man. That's... I got to say, you're probably out there in the cold, like doing all those knuckle busters, getting back into it is, it, well, uh, bless your heart. That's all I got to say. <laughs> um, and the video will be up soon enough, too. But <laughs> jump in here at the end. Okay, so we just did 59 part B, but there's one last part, part C. And Ryan, you are our reader. So in your smoothest reading voice, what does it ask us to do? In, uh, hold on. Uh, can I erase this? I'm erasing this. Ryan, could you please read us part C? Based on your answers to parts A and B, is it possible to have a total solar eclipse when the moon and sun are both at their maximum distance? Explain. Okay. So here, um, I'm going to use my... I'm going to use my resident rounding expert named Jenna to help me here. Now, Jenna, we have four sig figs and we have three sig figs, but to kind of compare them, uh, it looks to me like we're just going to need two sig figs. I always try to use the smallest number of sig figs possible to get the idea. So, Jenna, I want you to give me the angular size of the moon and the angular size of the sun at maximum distances, and I want you to round them down to two sig figs to make it easier for me to think about. Okay, so for the moon, it's 0 0.49 degrees. Okay. And for the sun, it's 0 0.52 degrees. Notice, Jenna, I only needed two sig figs to see the difference mm -hmm. in the angular sizes. So, Jenna, the question asks, is it possible to have a total solar eclipse when the moon and the sun are at maximum distances? What do you think the answer to that question is? Um, I would say yes, because they're very similar. So I feel like they could overlap and have a small ring around it. So it's total solar eclipse. Careful though. A okay. total solar eclipse does not feature a ring. Rem oh, I was now, okay. Now this isn't your fault because we didn't make it to eclipses. So this is probably why you, you, you are guessing it correctly. Let's take a look at the pictures once again. Shit. A total solar eclipse looks kind of like this. And I know this is a little bit confusing because you can see some of that corona light, but you will notice that the disk of the moon completely covers the disk of the sun, right? Now, you might say, Jenna, that 0 0.3 degrees, I'm sorry, point. 0 0.03 degrees isn't a lot, but I would say that 0 0.03 degrees times 60 is a two arc minute difference. For astronomers, two arc minutes is a big degree. In fact, the small telescope that I have laying next to my computer here can easily resolve a two arc minute angle. Hell, this piece of shit $50 telescope that someone bought as a gag gift practically, this could probably resolve a two arc minute difference. It's a pretty big angle. And it's not your fault, that's stuff that you learn over time. So let's, let's draw the picture of what's happening here. First, we're gonna draw the sun. And the sun has an angular size of 0 0.52 degrees, top to bottom. But the moon here has a slightly smaller angular size. I'll shade that in so we can see that that's the moon. 
And the moon's angular size, maybe some colors would help here. Is sorry, point shit, point four nine degrees. Jenna, do you remember what that type of an eclipse is called? Uh, a partial eclipse. Not a partial. I Anyone? Forget. Anyone out there remember? An angular eclipse. An annular eclipse. Angular. Annular. So in Latin. An annulus is a ring. They call it the ring of fire, an annular eclipse. So we will write down no at maximum distances a total solar eclipse. is not possible because the angular size of the moon is 0 0.03 degrees less than the sun. Once again, instead, you get an annular eclipse. This is kind of similar to the word problem that we did in question 48. But this was a little bit more robust and a little bit more mathematical. So it's kind of like a, a crescendo here to everything we've done today. And that, my fine feathered friends, concludes your first homework assignment. Congratulations. Sometimes they will be long and hard. Sometimes they will be short and easy. But at first, they're probably going to be long and difficult just because you guys are not well trained yet. As you get stronger, as you get better, we'll be able to move faster. Um, Jonathan, you probably got some of that down and that's cool. That'll save you a few moments when you watch the video later. Uh, I'll have this up. Uh, I'll have this up as soon as the video is done processing. Jonathan, if you wanna get to it right away, don't forget that I have a version of this same homework problem set from last semester, and you'll be able to follow along there right away if you want to get to it sooner. Or you can just wait a couple hours until you got it, Zach. I'll catch you on the flip side. OK, copy. That works for me, sir. All right. So um, let's just make sure that uh, everyone's gotten that down. Now, listen, what you're going to do now before you forget, take a photograph of everything we did submit it to Blackboard. And you know what I was thinking? Let's take a look at how everyone's submissions came out last time. Uh, it kind of, I kind of let you guys go last Monday. I, I think we did a little bit of this, but if I go to my needs grading section, oh. What's grade center? Huh, oh, needs grading, there we are. So here are the submissions for labs. Oh, it looks like a couple of people already got their homeworks up. Maybe they used the, the problem set from last semester. I don't know, probably. Let's see how people's submissions are looking. Remember that I wanna be able to see a little preview there. That's when it works the best. Um, and you have to make sure your format is good. Unfortunately, I'm dealing with glitch board here, so. Okay, for instance, I'm a little concerned about Savannah's submission. Savannah, when I look at her thing, I don't see anything. I don't know if that's Blackboard's fault or her fault, but I. 
Okay, this is the kind of shit that I can't stand. Um, I don't know. She's probably not watching the video live, but Tori has used a word editor. And like I mentioned earlier, you can't do your math like this. She didn't. She tried, but it's garbage. It's absolutely garbage. If you're going to type up your math, I need you to use an equation editor. If you cannot handle using an equation editor, you cannot handle submitting to me by Microsoft Word. So I'm going to have some harsh words for her come grading time. I don't like the look of that. So remember, if you don't know what you're doing with Microsoft Word, then, then you have to write it out. This is completely unacceptable. I'm definitely taking off points for this. She's shown no work. This is why you should definitely follow along with me and not try to do it on yourself. This, this is going to be a terrible homework. I'm going, to, I'm going to harshly penalize her because she has not shown me any of the work. She hasn't done any of the stuff that I wanted. No fucking way. Don't do this, okay? I'm here doing it with you so that you don't give me garbage like this. I hate to, to kind of shame people here, but I, I need you guys to see what is and what is not acceptable so that you start getting with the program. Um, let's see if we have anything good here. These are all people who did it without me. Look, no, 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 no. I don't want this. Okay, hopefully you guys aren't doing that. I want to see all of the work. That's why we did all this stuff. You have to basically just do what I do. All of the, see how we set things up, how we made it really robust. We showed the work, we showed the units. That's what I need to see. I'm guessing you guys are gonna have that because you did this with me. Those other people, they're gonna get some serious points taken off, okay? Now, if you watch my older video from last semester, Jonathan, if you don't have time to wait for this one, because remember, once I end the class today, I'm going to, I'm gonna process the video, which takes about an hour, an hour and a half. And then I have to upload it to YouTube, which takes another half an hour. So you may not see that video until about two hours from now, Jonathan, okay? And that's assuming there are no weird glitches. So if you- uh, yeah. That's fine. I can, I can either wait until after work and then I can do it, or I can look for your last video. But I think yeah. I need to resubmit the original lab one because I think the picture came out crooked or whatever else, not the, the paper. So yeah, let's take a look at that. I wanted to now look at the labs to see how you guys did that. So um, hold on, you are- Right there. Near the bottom. I think the picture's all messed up of the work. You can tell me what I did wrong or not. Sure. Uh, so let's I'd... click on you and see what we got here. I think it was a horrible picture that got submitted. Let's let's see. I can work as long as – well, I'll, I'll, let's just see what you got here. Hold on. See, You can see why this is very stressful to me because copy. Blackboard is so glitchy, and with 168 people, this becomes a really intense job to look at everyone's stuff. It's – it's the worst part of this job. It's the only part that I don't like. Um, okay, so this is clear enough. Uh, of course, if you had used pencil, it wouldn't look like that. This is okay. Oh, no, the it, problem is it came out fucking sideways, which is- That's what I mean, like, oh, okay. All right, so, so I'll resubmit it straight on. If you can, I allowed multiple submissions for that reason. So let's see what everybody else is doing here. Uh, there's Kimberly. We could click on a few people who are live in the class. Um, I have a question, Professor. Yes. I'm, so I'm using a free app on my phone, but it just scans my paper and it <laughs> submits it right into you. I just wanted to see if maybe we could look and see if there's any issues with that app submitting it in because it showed clear. Okay, let's check it. So uh, who am I talking to right now? What's your name? Uh, Molly. Last name. Uh, Molly, what's your last name? K-O-C-I-S. Oh, I'm sorry, what? K-O-C-I-S. Wait, it only showed, hold on, I gotta show all. This is, I hate Blackboard. Okay. Uh, Molly K-O something something. K-O-C-I-S. Okay. Let's see how Molly's is looking. Hey, this looks great. What app are you using? I'll tell other people about. Oh, it's could you- called, It's just called Scanner. Could you please put AS1010? Yeah. And don't forget to also put in the future lab one this way if there's any dispute later on about what you did or didn't submit you can find this is lab one this is lab two things like that kind of bookkeeping is important okay. okay molly what's the name of that app one more time it's just called scanner on apple that's pretty cool because your stuff looks great so jonathan maybe you could take a page out of molly's book um who else do i have here maybe we will do thank you 
Maybe we could check um, a few other people. I just submitted the homework for today. I did the lab um, when I watched the um, the lecture, but I need to like actually take a picture of it. Could you Hold tell on. me if um, it's Nori? Oh, Nori, hi. So sometimes when, when the screen is small, I can only see one or two people at a time. So uh, you want me to check yours, Nori? The homework, yeah. I didn't submit the lab yet. I'm gonna do that later today. All right, let's see if I can find you here. Hopefully it's okay. It's not like printed or like written on top of the document. Like I handwrote everything, wrote everything. Okay. And um, okay. We'll I hope it's out. acceptable. Why don't, yeah, this is a, the first couple of run throughs, it's kind of good for us to go through this. So everyone can get a sense of what's good and what's not good for me. So mm -hmm. let's see, uh, let me show all users here. Uh, Nori Murad, where are you? Mm -hmm. Where are you, Nori Murad? Okay, here you are. And you said you did not submit your lab yet? Okay, I so here's the, the irritating thing, Nori. You mm -hmm. submitted it, right? But instead yeah. of it showing up in the preview box, I don't know why this happens. I think if you submit it from your phone, this happens. It showed mm -hmm. up as a hyperlink. And Nori, that's wicked irritating for me because I have 160. Sorry. But here, just understand why. I have 168 people. So if I have to click 168 times three hyperlinks, I, mm -hmm. I just don't have enough time on planet Earth to get this done. Now, okay. let's say if I do click on your hyperlink, that looks great. So it's not the issue with your picture. It's uh, now I've it's been trying to sending it through. I don't know why I've been trying to figure out for like two semesters of doing this COVID stuff. Why does it sometimes show the preview like it did for other people? And why does it sometimes go as a hyperlink? I don't know mm -hmm. the answer for certain, but I think the answer is if you upload the JPEG directly from your phone, it seems to do that. Whereas if you were to send the JPEG to your computer and upload it from a computer, then it actually does the preview. So why don't we try that as an experiment? Now, listen, if all you can do is submit it this way and you have no other way, what I, I can accept this, but I'm going to hate it. Okay. So please try to figure it out for me if you can. What I did was I submitted it through the app. Blackboard. Um, I'll try to submit it through the but, um, but did you submit the actual directly website from your phone? Yeah, sometimes um, the the app and the website, they're kind of different as as for like its layout. <laughs> sometimes I can't do stuff on the app and I have to go to the website. And um, when I do submit um, the stuff through the website, it comes out like as like the actual picture. And like, I didn't know it came up that way because I can't see what you see when you pull up like an assignment. So um, I'll try next time with the lab and um, just- Yeah, so here, can I give you a tip, Nori? And I'm talking to everyone here. Rather than mm -hmm. upload it directly from your phone to Blackboard, you'll take those mm -hmm. pictures and you'll email them to yourself. Then you can open them up in your email or whatever, use OneDrive, whatever the hell you guys use, and then upload them mm -hmm. to Blackboard from the computer. And then I won't have to click the hyperlinks. I think that's what's going on. And I think you helped me figure this out. So in any case, the, the actual submissions, Nori, look great. They're all very clean and legible and it's right side up. It's just really irritating because with so many of you, do you see how long it takes mm -hmm. to load the screen? The hyperlinks really yeah. grind this shit down to a complete crawl for me. So it's, it's the best when I can just click a person and see a little preview, complain about it and move on, you know? So, so see what we can do. Now, if, if I'd rather have you do this than nothing, Obviously, I don't want you to be getting zeros. So if you can't figure it out, I don't want you to like tear your hair out. I just want you to try doing it from the computer to see if that fixes it. Okay. Okay. Well, it's either like I usually use my phone or like my iPad. That's what like I'm using right now. Okay. Um, but I'll try to use um, my email or like OneDrive or something and see how just, that works. Yeah. Just su just upload uh, just upload it from your email. That's all. You can use mm -hmm. your phone and your iPad, but upload from it. All right. Does anyone else want to see how theirs is going, or do you guys think you got this? Yeah. Um, can you check mine? Sorry. Sure. Who's who's you? Yudi. Yudi. Uh, what's your last name? Rodriguez. Just the um, homework. Is it okay? I, I think the lab. Looks good. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just okay. going to say that I kind of have to go right now. If that's oh, okay. That's fine, Nori. Upload it and I'll s make sure you upload that. Okay. Or you the, already do you want me to, no. do you want me to try and upload it again? 
no. Or try next it. time. Yeah. Okay. So, so okay. take care. Peace out. In fact, on that note, I'm going to actually stop the recording because I think the people watching get the message, but I'll check individual people, but let me stop the recording so I don't get file bloat.